we have produced 24 hours with just four hours to go in bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And it's all rooted in the behavioral principle of CQ, cultural intelligence, which is the capability to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you. We're talking adaptations that work. We're talking supporting the underrepresented. We're talking inclusive outcomes and reflecting on next steps with a panel from the RIBA with the ARB2. We're taking CQ action. Welcome to the final day of Reba Radio. Reba Radio with Marsha Rebrou. You are listening to the final day of live broadcasting on Reba Radio. We're live from the foremost architecture bookshop in the world at 66 Portland Place, where you can hear the atmosphere, the echo, the ambience of people moving, walking around, working here at the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects. I'm Marsha Ramroop. I'm the Director of Inclusion here. And now we've had a bit of practice. We've had seven days practice. So let's see if the team can finally do it really be coordinated we've been bringing you oh my gosh <laughs> they have to work on it still of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do and what's it rooted in uh, the principle of CQ, they, they really need work it must be friday uh what does cq stand for <laughs> They're feeling more Friday than I am. Cultural intelligence is a capability to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you. And it's broken down into these four strands, drive, knowledge, strategy and action. And so far, we've given you an overview of CQ, unconscious bias, inclusion in architecture. We've spoken about the first three capabilities, CQ drive, which is how much do you actually want to work and relate with those who are different from you? What motivations can you work on, especially when it's tough? And CQ knowledge is what do you know? What are you thinking about regarding others? And we spoke to some lived experiences, those around women, race, disability, LGBTQ plus lives and socioeconomic disadvantage. And we had two days talking CQ strategy, which is thinking about what you're thinking about. So planning those interactions, checking your assumptions and self-awareness. And it's about creating procedural changes to mitigate the impact of hidden bias. And now we're talking CQ action, the final CQ capability. We have to act and we have to be adaptable in order to be effective at working and relating with others. That means looking at adaptations at work with Siraj Mitha, Amy Francis Smith, Annette Fisher and Professor Katrina Jackman. Supporting the underrepresented with Rebecca Lovelace, Neil Onions, Dana Walker and Deborah Williams. Inclusive outcomes, with Hikaru Nisanke, Arthur Mamumani, and Mark Nagel. And then we'll be looking forward, the RIBA alongside the ARB about the future and inclusion in the sector. I'm sure you didn't expect anything less on our final show. It's a big one. All after. Shock stats. Reports show 69% of women who off-ramp would have stayed at their companies if they had flexible work options. 88% of workers consider flexible working hours as one of the most valuable benefits. 96% of companies where men are involved in gender diversity report progress compared to just 30% where men are not involved. Sweet Solutions. Yeah, we're going to be talking some sweet solutions because Seek You Action is about being adaptable and knowing when it's appropriate and not to make those adaptations. When it comes to meeting the needs of the underrepresented in architecture and the built environment, it's important that we look to create equity by looking for how we can make relevant changes to our systems. And joining me now to speak about this is Siraj Mitha, Amy Francis Smith, Annette Fisher, and Professor Katrina Jackman. Um, I'd like to start with you, Siraj. And uh, what I'd like you to do is introduce yourself and briefly describe an adaptation that's worked for you in your career, either that you've come across or that you've created yourself. 
Um, well, thank you very much for having me this morning, Marsha. It's great to be on the radio. Um, so, yeah, my name is Siraj. Um, I am an architect. Um, I've practiced for the last three years at Stanton Williams Architects, working um, in a team there on the New Museum of London. Um, and I now um, run the Accelerate program as part of Open Cities Outreach. Uh, and I also teach uh, undergraduate architecture at the Bartlett. So the question was uh, an adaptation program that has worked for me in, in the past. Yeah, or indeed uh, that you've created. Well, so um, one of the things that we did at Stanton Williams was create um, a sort of uh, virtual outreach program. It was during the time of the pandemic, which would be broadcast to participating secondary schools to introduce them to possibilities of studying architecture, going into study and practice, what it means to be an architect, how can you sort of sign up, how can you get involved and then we sort of, so me and a team of architects there um, sort of answered questions as, as we um, gave this sort of um, really interesting presentation to them, yeah. Really interesting, we'll deep dive into that in a moment. Um, Annette, if I can ask you to introduce yourself and briefly describe an adaptation that's worked for you in your career, either that you've come across or you've created yourself. Morning, Marsha. Thanks very much for having me here again. Um, well, for the first time, rather. Uh, my name is uh, Annette Fisher. Uh, I'm an architect um, and I'm chair of Let's Build, which is uh, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and I'm also... Um, uh, partner of FA Global and co-chair of Union, a um, consortium of female-led architects practices. Um, in terms of uh, an adaptation, I, I would talk about Let's Build, which we started um, in 2019 before the pandemic, uh, which uh, was, we, we started that to showcase and celebrate uh, practices uh, that are led by diverse individuals. Um, as a way of, first of all, um, bringing uh, awareness in the environment to uh, those people from underrepresented backgrounds, women and uh, others, uh, you know, in this environment for people to know that, you know, we exist. Okay, we'll definitely deep dive into that shortly. Uh, Amy Francis-Smith, if I can get you to do the same, introduce yourself and briefly describe an ad adaptation that's worked for you in your career, either that you've come across or you've created yourself. Well, uh, morning everyone. Uh, I'm Amy Francis-Smith. I'm the Vice President of the Birmingham Architecture Association. I'm a disabled architect and I specialise in access consultancy um, particular focus on inclusive design and accessible architecture for disabled people and elderly people. Um, I suppose my personal adaptation is that I ended up having to take a four day week because I have chronic illnesses, which meant that I needed that bit of flexibility and time there to have recuperation. And I suppose in terms of a very physical um, thing that I use, I use a sit stand desk, which means I can you know, not have a stiff back and can actually um, sort of focus on my work a bit more without sort of being sat all day. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. And finally, uh, Professor Katrina Jackman, if you could introduce yourself and briefly describe an adaptation that's worked for you in your career, either you've come sure. across. Mm. Good morning, everybody, and, and thank you for having me. So I'm not an architect. Um, I'm a physicist, actually. Uh, so I'm Professor Katrina Jackman. I'm a senior professor at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and I'm a planetary scientist. So I study Jupiter, Saturn, and lots of other magnetized planets in our solar system. But one of the major initiatives uh, which I have benefited from and which is currently running in Ireland is something called the Senior Academic Leadership Initiative, SALI, S-A-L-I. And that is a scheme whereby the Irish government and specifically the Higher Education Authority recognized that specific action needed to be taken to address the significant gender imbalance at the higher levels of academic leadership. And so they set aside a part of funding to facilitate the recruitment of um, women and other minorities into the, the higher echelons of academic leadership, uh, specifically professorial positions in universities and research institutes across Ireland. So that scheme is proving really successful in, in beginning to address uh, some of those imbalances um, in higher academic leadership. 
So, Katrina, I think some people may have thought it's strange that I invited an astrophysicist to come to talk to architects and the built environment. But when I heard about the Sally scheme um, uh, and you were, that you were part of, I, I really wanted the opportunity to hear from you um, to share it about a possible way that we could potentially look to support women in the profession. So, Katrina, if you don't mind just sharing, what was the process for you like? What, what did you actually have to do to, to get onto this scheme? Well, it was an open competition. So it's the onus is on the institutes or the universities to uh, secure a post, which they then advertise uh, in open competition. And so the step that had to be taken initially by universities or institutes was to demonstrate their need for a position like this. So to demonstrate their need for that funding. And that is through quantifying what their current balance is, but also listing out some of the initiatives that they've already tried and some of their plans into the future for how they will um, address uh, gender inequality and inclusion, inclusion and diversity. And so uh, the institute where I'm based now, the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, put together a case uh, for one of these Sally positions, which uh, they then received the funding for, and then they advertised it as an open competition and I applied and did a Zoom interview uh, as, as is the way these days and I was appointed uh, just this year. So the actual pot of funding, it's a government pot, is it? Yes, it's it's a scheme through the Higher Education Authority. So it's, it's being uh, rolled out across institutes and universities uh, throughout the Republic of Ireland. And so uh, my position is in physics, but there are also Sally positions across all uh, different uh, parts of academia, so not just in the sciences, but in any area where a case can be made for the need for increased uh, diversity in those higher levels of academic leadership. I mean, physics is a particularly uh, imbalanced area, so, uh, you know, I have worked obviously in physics for, for my entire career and in astronomy and space science and it's not uncommon for me to be in scenarios where the male to female ratio is 10 to 1. I've been in scenarios where it's 15 to 1. I'm kind of used to it, but uh, clearly uh, there is a need to address the reasons behind those kind of imbalances and there are arguments to be made uh, for the fact that uh, implementing quotas can significantly accelerate progress towards equality. Well, thank you, Katrina, for now. Um, that must sound very interesting to you, Annette, especially in light of the work that you've been doing. So tell me a little bit more about Let's Build It and, and Union as well. Well, yeah, I mean, actually, that's very, um, very exciting to hear about that, Sally, because definitely when we started Let's Build, one of the key reasons was also, was not just celebrating, but so that the establishments would know that there were people of uh, this level and caliber of um, knowledge and experience in the built environment um, that could be recruited to these um, senior levels. Because definitely, you know, in, um, in the, uh, if you look at the boardrooms or board, board levels of, you know, arch not just architectural practices, but any of the built environment organizations, there is a, you know, a significant lack of both women and people of color um, in those positions. And, you know, that we need people in those positions because that is when we can affect change. Um, and very often the, d the discussion is, oh, we couldn't find anybody who looked like, you know, who, who looked like them. We couldn't find anyone of that, of that ilk. And so, um, you know, that's the other reason for Let's Build. So there's no excuse, you know, know um and um uh, in, in doing that and uh talking about union union is um it's actually a new collaborative which uh, we set up in january of this year um it's a co um a consortium of female-led architects practices and we set it up um because um as of last year if southwark put out had put out a a, a um, framework to attract new and diverse practices to it for their um you know for their uh for their projects and and their um uh, budget new sort of 400 billion budget and at the end of it um they had 110 practices and not one of them were black led or you know and so they put it out again in december 
And so I called up um, these women, uh, Terry and Helen and Cheryl, um, Anna Maria and Angeline, and said, you know, what, what, what do you know? What can we do to win this? And um, ask them if they would like to to come together to create this consortium and submit uh, a bid for for the framework. Um, and um, I'm happy to say that you know, not only did we uh, we shortlisted, and then we interviewed, and then we. Um, you know, and then we found we've made it made it onto the list. And not only did we make it onto, we had applied for three lots. Not only did we make it onto the list, we made it onto two um, quite significant lots, not the new per practice lots, um, but on uh, one for residential and for commercial. Um, and for for us, this is a real breakthrough because, as you know, um, it's a as a collective of women and not just women, but diverse women, women of color getting onto a framework like this and for small practices as well um, this is um, quite um, uh, quite a big big deal and, and I have to I'm happy to say that also LHC and Southwark who we had to jump through a number of hoops with are also excited for us to be there so yeah that's what it's about. That's, that sounds really good and, and we'll delve a little bit into sort of what kind of adaptations the councils have considered as a result of taking you on as well. Um, just a, a point about uh, uh, Professor Katrina Jackman, she's based in the Republic of Ireland so the funding that uh, has been created for the Sally scheme is, is from the Irish government so it's only available in Ireland but it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, a scheme that I think that maybe we can uh, we can learn from. Um, Siraj, tell me a little bit about you know the kind of adaptations that you've been working on and the mentoring schemes as well yes um so i'm i'm currently involved in this uh program called accelerate which is a pro um which is involved in encouraging 16 to 18 year olds from underrepresented backgrounds in uh, all across london to explore professions in the built industry so architecture planning engineering landscape architecture as a means to sort of widen participation um, but also democratize the processes regarding our built environment um, the pro the program's been running for 10 years. I've been running it for four months, so I'm in a very fortunate position to inherit this like incredibly strong thing that has a lot of momentum now. A lot of people know about it. And um, yeah, the, it, it runs, we have sort of 12 workshops that run between October and May. Um, we invite uh, built industry professionals to come and mentor um, uh, uh, as part of that. So they, uh, the students are delegated to each practice for one-to-one -one mentoring for, uh, uh, I think, a total of 12 hours. And the whole thing sort of culminates in a uh, summer exhibition. And as part of that, we offer uh, industry professionals the opportunity to come and teach, to come and mentor, to come and uh, facilitate certain uh, particular sessions. And the whole thing is, is fantastic. It's got this sort of amazing track record now in, in, in its 10th year. I think we've helped 350 uh, young people gain access to the profession um, and, it's, and it's working well. We're looking to, you know, it's fantastic. We are looking to expand. And you know, some of the things that Annette is, uh, is saying absolutely relevant. You know, it's this is one part of the journey, um, providing access to young people into those professions. But it's then about how do we uh, create um, opportunities for them to gain positions of authority? How do we keep them within the profession? How do we support them on that journey to actually becoming an architect rather than um, getting them into into university and then facing the obstacles um, that that people have to face and then maybe dropping out um, prematurely from those courses. So. Um, the Accelerate course has been working fantastically. We are looking to expand and we would like to sort of continue that support along the journey. Well, we'll find out how uh, you can be supported in just a moment. But Amy, um, certainly, you know, adaptations that, that work are, are something that you're maybe still campaigning a little bit for. But, um, you know, can you can you share a little bit more about, you know, you've made some personal adaptations for yourself, but when it comes to amplifying the disability voice in architecture, be it, you know, getting, um, attracting uh, those who are, who are disabled into the profession, as well as progressing them through architecture, as well as progressing them through um, practice and in terms of you know accessible design and products and services there's still quite a lot of work to do I'm sure which you're you're trying to, to work on so explain some of the work that you're doing. Yeah it's, it's, it's definitely a multi-pronged uh, tactic that I'm trying to come up partly through um, sort of bringing students into the architecture profession in the first place and being people with more diverse and um, on the spectrum of disability 
Uh, I do quite a lot of teaching at universities to try and educate our future architects around inclusive design. And it's more than just, you know, part M building regs or you've got a ramp and a lift and that's about it. Um, it's so much more detailed than that. And I always compare it to sort of how we would have eco design and maybe 15, 20 years ago where you've got a solar panel and you've got a green roof. So it's eco. But is that really an accessible space? And it's, it's also about acknowledging who's currently in our industry as well. The ARB only really uh, registers 1% of architects who are disabled, who are self-declaring disabled anyway. Um, but the, the UK population is 19% who are disabled as the largest minority group. So there's a huge misrepresentation of people. Um, there's an awful lot of designing for the disabled. It's kind of this, this, over, this old knowledge uh, oversight of um, like we need to pity them, but they're, they're poor people who need assistance rather than having action and autonomy for themselves. So I'd like to see more disabled people doing the designing uh, for one. Um, and a lot of my work also is about seeding that idea into designers' minds about the fact that there is a huge amount of, there's 14.1 million disabled people in the UK who largely aren't really being addressed in multiple uh, areas. Obviously that could be a physical mobility, could be a wheelchair user, it could be a visual impairment or a hearing impairment. And the way that we're designing isn't helping people, it's, it's really restricting people's lives. And that's something that I do quite a lot of campaigning for and lobbying governments to um, change legislation to try and um make people aware that there's more it's a social responsibility there Yes, I mean, like you say, massive job. And we have been speaking about all of those things on, on Reba Radio, so people can listen back to some of those those points as well. Um, Katrina, uh, one of the wonderful things about, you know, you you being in the role is, is being able to, to role model for others. Um, but that can be quite a burden to bear at times. How do you manage uh, that kind of role modelling uh, perspective as well? Yeah, absolutely. It can be tough because I'm only human and I, I make lots of mistakes uh, but I, of course I do my best to be a role model for, for all of my team and my group and I suppose over the years of my career I have come across various barriers to progression and increasingly as I've you know progressed to the, the higher levels of academic leadership it is often the case that I'm maybe the first female to be on a particular committee or be in a particular position and, and that almost requires me to be an agent for change. Uh, so for example, um, when uh, you know when I had my first child uh, six years ago now, um, you know myself and my husband were uh, shared parental leave in our respective universities. He, he was in academia at the time too. And so it's kind of trailblazing in terms of just just getting our heads around how the admin of that was going to work. And we were extremely well supported. And I was at the University of Southampton at the time, and he was at uh, UCL, University of College London, not, not far from where uh, your recording is happening today. So uh, sometimes it's a pain when you're the first person to, uh, to do something, and then there are some sort of logistical hurdles to get over. But I also feel immensely privileged by the mentors that I've had and the barriers that some of them have broken. And so I think there, you know, things like the Sally scheme are big steps. They are, uh, you know, centrally funded by government. They, they make a big statement about a commitment to uh, equality and diversity. But there are also so many small steps which can work across any field, just in terms of changing the day-to-day -day culture of a workplace. So, you know, I, I've had many years of being spoken over in meetings, for example. So now, a very practical thing, which we do in my group meetings, where we have our round table of eight or nine of us every week, is I chair and then everybody has to put up their hand before they speak and then I call on them in the order in which they put their hand up. So everybody is heard, everybody's opinion is equally respected and nobody is ever interrupted. And it's, it's, it's so simple and, it, you know, it's so obvious, but actually that, that does feed into a culture where 
I, I think that everybody feels uh, respected. So I'm just, I'll just give one, one other example of something which uh, we found works well is, is having a core hours policy. So saying our core working hours for our institute are 10 a.m. to 4. And so for anyone who has, for example, a caring responsibility or if they're dropping you know, children off at, at school or childcare, there are no regular meetings scheduled that start at 9 a.m. because that might be difficult for those people to get to. So that just facilitates uh, people making their work work around their personal lives. And those small changes, I think, just also indicate an institute's willingness to uh, just to support its employees and to, to get the best out of a diverse workforce. Siraj Mitha, uh, Amy Francis Smith, Annette Fisher and Professor Katrina Chapman were talking about CQ action adaptations that work and we'll have more from them after Whitney. REBA Charter members can access a range of practical resources and get 50% off our digital professional services contracts. Join the REBA today and get the rest of 2021 for free. Coming up in the next hour, we're talking about ways uh, people can directly support the underrepresented. Yesterday, we had an extraordinary, really extraordinary conversation discussing decolonialization in architecture with architectural historian uh, Dr. Neil Shustor, Professor Corinne Fowler, the director of Colonial Co Countryside and the National Trust Houses Reinterpreted, and students Harsha Gore and Jasmine Lawrence from the Decolonized Architecture Group. If you missed it, you haven't missed it. Uh, we really hope to have it subtitled and up on the Reba YouTube channel as soon as possible. And uh, we'll be creating podcasts from all our speech content, which will be available as soon as we can make them. At the moment, we're talking with Siraj Mitha, Amy Francis Smith, Annette Fisher and Professor Katrina Jackman about CQ action adaptations at work. And uh, just before Whitney uh, singing about higher love, um, I saw you, Amy, on the Zoom, then nodding your head away along with what... Uh, Katrina was saying around about some really simple changes that can be made that have actually quite a profound impact on people's ability to feel included in the workplace. Yeah, completely. Well, well, definitely I was agreeing with the uh, the ratio of 10 to 1 in a room as well, which um, I've equally experienced a few times. And I uh, I really like the, the putting up the hand implementation, sort of I'm holding the speaking stick kind of thing. Um, I think the, the the pandemic has actually been although awful in many many ways it's been hugely uh, eye-opening especially with uh, remote working and sort of flexible hours from um, sort of working from home which is something that disabled people mothers parents uh, many many people for many years have been asking for and it just hasn't been something that's been uh, believed to be uh, effective um, I think we've all proved that to be uh, wrong now and it actually means it's that you're opening up such a, a diverse and pool, like diverse pool of knowledge of, of talent that's out there of people that were previously not able to fit into the nine to five box where you do your commute every single day and it now means that um, so many more disabled people or parents are now able to engage in the workspace and actually um, companies can actually harness their insight of those employees and sort of help to drive market innovation and sort of, and sort of retain top talent who would have maybe previously gone, oh, I can't, I can't do your rigid um, time timings. So, and, and flexible working, I think recently, only in the few days, there's been some research that's come out that um, proves that it will boost the economy by 55 billion pounds a year. And by refusing to have flexible working, it's, it harms the economy by 2 billion. So even just on like a financial level, it makes complete sense. Um, I suppose the, uh, the sort of, the, the, the sort of tips that you can help to have people get into the workplace is around sort of, obviously more specifically around maybe uh, people with disabilities. It's around learning that, you know, you legally have a right to have reasonable adjustments put in place. And there are things that are out there such as the government access to work fund which is a, a grant scheme that means that employees and employers have uh, a pot of money to be able to help with 
I don't know, maybe you need a taxi to work or you might need a, a sign language interpreter at some point for a meeting or a larger conference. Or um, it might just be training for the, the company, for the other members of the staff. Um, so there was quite a lot of um, aid out there that not many people know to tap into. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the points that is being made here in the studio as well is that uh, that sense that, you know, having that government support and that state support really does make a difference in being able to actually create change and, and, and push for change. I mean, you know, one of the things that's happened for you, Annette, is that the councils who were looking at their procurement have made some adaptations so union can come on board. Tell us about that. Well, I think it was a bit more of us perhaps fighting our corner. Um, but I think that um, definitely when we went in uh, for the bid, we went in quite obviously as a new organisation. Well, whilst union is new, the members, though, are, you know, have many years, over 30 years, people like myself, Terry and Samita, experience in, in practice and in running projects. And I think for them, they, they did recognise that. Now, um, definitely they had um, certain, you know, rules and that, that they wanted us to, to um, abide by, which we... Um, which we did to a, to a certain extent. But then, you know, for example, they had wanted us to give, for example, uh, financials for, um, you know, for our, each of our practices. And we had to hit back and say, well, actually, you know, your rules state that if you are, um, if any member in your group are 20% uh, or um, are less than 20%, then you don't have to do an individual application for each um, member of the group, you can do one um, complete application. Um, and even when we uh, submitted uh, additional information, they came back and said, oh, yes, we want the financials. And I said, well, we're, we're following your rules. Um, but based on your rules, you, you asked us for option um, you had an option A, B and C. We chose option C and now you would like us to do option A. And whilst we understand the reasons for your needing that, um, you know, we don't feel that this, uh, you know, we've abided by what you've um, you've given us. Um, and what we said to them was, you know, and they said to us, this was the first time they've ever, ever had anything like this. Um, and we said, well, the only way for you to know that this could work is if you test it and put us on that list. Um, but having come through it that one of the things they did say was um, uh, later on afterwards when we had the onboarding process was they said Annette when we had the interview with all of you um, you guys just smashed it out the park I mean and, and from that we will never do this without interviews um, and I think in the past these frameworks have been done just through numbers and and information on a page um, but it just shows goes to show that um, they could see from when we met with them that um, we had more than enough um, you know kudos experience and knowledge to be able to be part of it yeah, certainly there's something about educating the system, those who, who are in charge with in, enforcing the system as well isn't there Siraj? Yeah I mean uh, I think that like uh, local council support is in incredibly important you need to sort of be able to prove your success in um, in, in with their support I think that um, Bur we're sort of like uh, Open City has existed you know, in a similar way for 30 years and Accelerate is, has existed for 10. If you know, we talked earlier about state, about state support, um, it would be um, fantastic to see more local boroughs come in. Accelerate exists, uh, Accelerate has um, students come from every borough, from literally all across London. And in the past, we've had um, fantastic relationships with Camden. We've had re relationships with Southwark. This year, we've got a relationship with um, London Borough of Barking and Dagenham, which is um, incredible. But, you know, it sort of exists year on year, um, literally by the generosity of these organisations and the support of these organisations. And I think that um, moving forwards, people need to have a, a little bit more trust. They need to do um, their research and understanding the success that we're sort of generating from these programs in introducing and diversifying the fields in architecture and the built environment. Um, it would be fantastic to see, you know, Katrina talks about um, state support in Ireland. That would be absolutely fantastic, you know, to not have to, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's fine to, uh, to propose, it's fine to go in for bids, for sponsorship, and we can continue to do that. But I just, I, I, I suppose if we were, to be met halfway if the sort of trust factor was there with the with the government 
then perhaps it wouldn't it wouldn't sort of rest on a knife edge each year and it wouldn't rest on a few people uh, and their absolute incredible generosity to make these really really important programs work so you do need support though so let, let, let's let's park for the moment that you know we need to get government involved in and in, in trying to you know create all kinds of schemes, not just for architecture. Um, but at the moment, you know, a, a mentorship scheme like Accelerate needs support. So what kind of support can you, are you wanting to so, get yeah, there? There's, there's several different ways to support the programme. I mean, like um, each year, like I say, you know, we've got um, mentor practices. So that's architects, engineers, um, planners. Um, design review panels, people who sign up and, and sort of dedicate their time to training our young people, to training our students. Um, we have a, a sort of plethora of volunteers who help at each of the 12 workshops, give up their sort of Saturdays and, um, and help take the students through whatever activities we have planned. Then of course there's financial support. So we try and you know, the things that we um, supply each student with, with the sort of staff, the sort of paid staff that take that take part in the program, the materials that um, we are able to sort of um, give to the students, the places that we're able to take them, really exciting venues across London. All of these things require sort of a level of financial support, a level of vo volunteer support, um, and each year sort of rely on, on that and the generosity of those people who believe in the program. Obviously, you're working in London. That's right. Yeah. Um, do you know of and can are there other programs outside of London that you can advocate for at all? Outside of London, I'm not entirely familiar. I mean, the the RIBA has a sort of national schools program, which I'm which I know is very successful, and um, we would like to sort of partner with the RIBA actually in bringing the Accelerate program outside the M25. That would be fantastic. I think that these programs are successful, but they shouldn't be um, they shouldn't be confined to London. I think that there'd be massive interest in, in cities like Birmingham, Manchester, Cardiff, e everywhere. I think people, young people deserve the opportunity to at least explore the opportunity of, um, of, of studying, operating, working in, in the built-in industries. Yeah, so it would be fantastic to, to see a sort of expansion of these programs, to see a partnership with, with the RIBA and to sort of work in collaboration rather than perhaps in competition in the future. Yeah, that would be great. You've got my number. Um, <laughs> <Thanks so> <laughs> Katrina, if I can come to you, because um, one thing is, you know, it's it's all well, well and good sort of having these um, quotas and having uh, this diversity of people coming in and being supported financially. But when you get into these positions, um, being able to work within a culture of inclusion is something that perhaps is, is the next step. So um, what's it like for you? I know you talked about some, still sometimes being the only. Um, how do you help others to create a culture of inclusion and what more do you think can be done to to create those cultures that's a great question and i think so far today we've talked a lot about um sort of how of making uh places more more diverse and more inclusive but i think it's really important to to step back occasionally and remember why <clears throat> why are we doing this why you know, why should we not just have all male heterosexual men, all male men, um, all, you know, all of one particular demographic, for example, um, in a field, because if you're with people who are like you, one would argue that maybe, you know, it's just easier because you know how each other think. So uh, certainly over the years uh, in, in physics and astronomy, I've Sadly, I come across many people who just roll their eyes at the diversity agenda. They just don't see the need for it. They think it's it's a box ticking exercise at best. Um, and really, I feel like we need to win over a certain proportion of those people if we're going to make significant progress. And I really think it's important to have buy-in at all levels in an institute for the diversity um, agenda. So uh, a really nice example of how that worked well uh, was in the University of Southampton, uh, where, where I was previously based up to 2019. And there we were putting together an application for something called the Athena Swan, so a charter which is centered around diversity and inclusion. And there was 
an, an almost unspoken policy that it was men who were going to lead that. And in so many other environments, sadly, um, the, you know, the minority group are put in charge of fixing the problems, so to speak, for the minority group. And actually, in Southampton, it worked so well that uh, because there were several men who were leading um, the gender equality charge, there was just a more broad buy-in to that and more people were recognizing why it was important. So it's just it's coming back again to this question of why, you know, why is a workplace better when it's diverse? Well, my view on that is because it, you avoid uh, what you call um, groupthink. So you avoid just having a load of people who all just automatically agree with each other. Having um, a diverse workplace brings more creativity, it brings more energy, it brings uh, just a, a breadth of a world view. And certainly in science and indeed in architecture as well, you know, creative areas, you want to have that, that mix, you want to have people challenging those ideas. And so how you get that buy-in from people uh, varies depending on their level of eye rolling at the gender um, agenda uh, or the diversity agenda. So there are a couple of ways to do it. You can appeal to their better nature. You can tell them that if they're going to apply for funding, they won't get it unless they have signed up to a particular charter. Um, those are kind of the two extremes of the scale. But there are uh, there are various techniques which which can and should be applied to to get that that, that wider wider uh, buy in, and I think that's that's really crucial. Amy, you award winning <laughs> um, uh, disability um, uh, campaigner. Um, this sense of needing to get that buy in from those who have the power and the authority to actually make the change has been quite crucial. Something that you've been working very hard on. Yeah, well, people have power at all different levels. So, it, you know, okay, yes, it's government legislation or it's sort of wider, far reaching organisations, but it's also, you know, internal working groups inside a specific company where you, you're like Katrina was going on about, um, you know, the whys and trying to convince people why it's beneficial. And it's, it's sort of trying to convince, uh, even get a commitment from the leadership team to, to sort of evaluate and review and have people come around together rather than it being driven from the minority groups who have got together to try and fix the problem. Like it needs to be, there's a, a bottom up and a top down approach. And um, it's, it's always, I think it's always a really pertinent question to ask who isn't in the room and why aren't they there? Um, and quite often, um, you know, it could even just be physically, like can they even physically get in the building? Are you working in an office space or in an environment or a lab or, a, you know, a construction site? Can people physically get there? Can they even engage with the conversation? Um, and if not, why not? And talk, start asking those difficult questions. And it doesn't have to be asking your director or it doesn't have to be asking your, you know, your associate or team leader. It could also be asking the shopkeeper or it's the events manager or it's the... Um, you know, it, there's the right into your MP even. There's there's bigger implications about um, taking responsibility as an advocate, as an ally, of realizing that okay, well I've got here, but how can I then help others come along after me? And if I can give you the final word <laughs> around that that advocacy and allyship uh, that's required from from the wider sector, uh, what are you looking for, um, and and what would you recommend uh, that people did in order to demonstrate not just allyship but that um, active advocacy and coalition with the underrepresented in uh, in the built environment and architecture. Um, well, I think what I'd like, what I would say is, you know, I, I'm sort of very tired of the rhetoric um, and it's, 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 it's about, you know, demonstrating and doing these things um, where you have, um, for example, um, you know, uh, Katrina, you talked about the why um, and, you know, when we started Let's Build, 
we've actually evolved from when we started and started um, um, presenting. We've now um, uh, started something called the Let's Build Academy because we recognize that the greatest attrition um, for um, underrepresented in architecture is that they are at, at the part one. After the first, they've got their first degree, they want to get their first job and they can't get that job. And so what we want to try and do is partner, which is, and actually that's sort of coming off from, from um, Siraj, um, the 16 to 18 year olds, you know, so, so that they can, um, we want to partner uh, prax, um, um, part ones with uh, practices. And what we want those practices to do is to sign up to the academy with an annual membership. We would like to offer them a, all their social value and um, EDI recruitments for that year and we will mentor that student um, and and uh, which they will need that guidance during that first year of employment because for sure when a, when a person of color black or brown goes or disabled goes into a practice you know they will invariably be in the minority that you know one in ten one in fifteen and they're going to need that support so you know it's about uh, you know seeing it it's seeing is believing you know if you're going to be uh, uh, inclusive in your practice have the disabled have the brown have the women have the have them there in your practice you know it's it's not enough to say i'm diverse and you and we go to the board to your website and to your board um, and we look at your board and all that's there is one demographic white male um, what does that do for you I mean we need the collective genius of all of us in order to make a change and to make a difference to not just the built environment but to the issues of climate change and everything that's happening on this planet we need all all of us to bring our collective experiences to the table. And until we are in the boardrooms, top down, bottom up, boardrooms and at the grassroots, we are not going to be able to really affect and make that difference and make that change. A rallying cry from Annette Fisher to end on. Thanks to Siraj Mitha, Amy Francis-Smith, Professor Katrina Jackman and Annette Fisher talking about CQ action, adaptations at work. It's time for the specials. We have a prize draw for tickets for their gig. So let's hear one of their iconic songs, Nelson Mandela. You're listening to Reba Radio. Real inclusive, brilliant action with Marsha Remu. Have you visited Reba Academy yet? Reba Academy is the one-stop shop for all digital Reba CPD. Access a wide choice of live and on-demand content on topics such as sustainability, fire safety and building regulations. Anyone can access Reba Academy by signing up for a free account today. If you are a Reba member, just log in with your membership details and you'll get access to all of our courses at special discounted prices. Visit today at architecture.com forward slash Reba Academy. Today, our final My Soundtrack is from Joni Tyler, the long-serving, <laughs> I said that with a bit of a smile, but she did say she's been here decades, uh, the long-serving Reba Head of CPD. Her role is to support architects to be skilled and competent and their inclusion and diversity skills and understanding are all part of that. Joni was born in Ohio and she studied at Berkeley uh, where she did a radio show and she has too many favourite mu musical artists and albums to choose from, but she says she does revisit Loveless by My Bloody Valentine more than any other. So tune in between 5 and 6 p.m. today for that. Oh, we have two fabulous prizes to give away. Win a two-night stay for you and a friend or lover in one of Mallinson's gorgeous woodland tree houses. They are uniquely designed, they are funky, they are luxury, and they are amazing, amazing, amazing prize to win. But not just that, you could win tickets to see the specials live. Their show next July uh, in Dublin, it sold out ages ago, but we've got two tickets for our lucky winners, plus a night stay at a hotel of your choice in Dublin, up to the value of 200 pounds. <laughs> To enter the draw, you have just two hours left to enter. So do go to architecture.com, fill in the form, and the magic word you need is giraffe. Giraffe. The winners will be announced shortly. Um, you can you just get a, a wonderful, wonderful poster for just entering. So do go to architecture.com. Full terms and conditions are on there. You have two hours left to enter. If you're listening on repeat, the draw is closed. Oh.
Broadcasting your inclusion journey online, 18th to the 26th of November. You're listening to Reba Radio. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place. Yeah, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects with me, Marsha Ramrip. I'm the Director of Inclusion at the RIBA. Oh my word, I can't believe it. We're 25 hours down. We've only got three hours to go in bringing you 28 hours. <laughs> Were you pleased about the 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do? <laughs> that is all rooted in that behavioral principle of CQ cultural intelligence. We've spoken about adaptations at work. We're next going to be talking about supporting the underrepresented. Later, we're talking inclusive outcomes and then reflecting on next steps with a final panel with the RIBA and the ARB2. We're taking CQ action. This is the final day of Reba Radio. Reba Radio with Marsha Remu. You are listening to the final day of broadcasting live on Reba Radio. We're live from the foremost architectural bookshop in the world here at 66 Portland Place, where you can hear the atmosphere of people moving, walking around, working here at the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects. I'm Marsha Ramroop. I'm the Director of Inclusion here. Now, we're going to have another go at this because I didn't quite do it, the team, last time. Come on, people. Let's do this. We've been bringing you... 28 hours! ...of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And what's it rooted in? The principle of CQ. And what does CQ stand for? By 2 p.m. when we're off air, they'll probably be like a choir then, like a choir. Uh, cultural intelligence is the capability to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you. And it's broken down into those four strands, drive, knowledge, strategy and action. And so far, we've given you that overview of CQ, unconscious bias, inclusion in architecture. We've spoken about those first three capabilities. CQ drive, how much do you want to work with those who are different from you? What motivations can you work on, especially? when things are tough and CQ knowledge is about what do you know what are you thinking about when regarding others and we spoke about some lived experiences uh, of the underrepresented in architecture like women race disability LGBTQ plus lives socioeconomic disadvantage and then we had two days talking CQ strategy which is thinking about what you're thinking about, planning those interactions, checking your assumptions, self-awareness. It's about creating procedural changes to mitigate the impact of hidden bias. And now we're talking CQ action, the final CQ capability, because we have to act. We have to be adaptable in order to be effective at working and relating with others. So now we're talking about supporting the underrepresented with Rebecca Lovelace, Neil Onions, uh, Deborah Williams and Dana Walker and and all of that is after our dish of the day. My name's Amanda, Amanda Barlow. Uh, I work for the Southwest team. I'm based in Bristol. I was asked to give you a recipe and I don't really cook that much, but over the summer, I learned to cook five bean chili, which was an absolute winner. Um, great to take camping, you can have it as an evening meal and also um, really nice for breakfast as well. Um, how it's made, five beans, I add uh, chickpeas and butter beans, kidney beans, a couple of bubbles of your own choice, um, some nice fresh coriander, chop that all up. Uh, with some onion, some garlic, fry that up in a pan, add some tin tomatoes, add your beans, give that a nice big stir, bit of tomato sauce, and then you serve that with um, some rice, or it goes really nice with um, tortilla chips and a nice bit of cheese as well. I also want to tell you about an event that we have coming up. It's called Architecture and Art. It's at an amazing gallery in Bristol. So it's a gallery takeover. It's on the 1st of December, 6 till 9. Please go on to architecture.com to register for tickets. They're still available. It'd be great to see you for an in-person event and have a little celebration drink before Christmas. Cheers. Sweet Solutions. 
CQ Action is about being adaptable and taking the actions to be supporting uh, of the underrepresented and being mindful of their needs and actions and reactions. When it comes to meeting the needs of the underrepresented in architecture and the built environment, there's some great people out there doing some great work that we can all learn from. And joining me to talk about this now is Rebecca Lovelace, Neil Onions and Deborah Williams. If I can ask you first, Rebecca, to introduce yourself and briefly describe how you support the underrepresented. Can I say, starting with the recipe has made me really, really hungry. So um, thank you so much for having me. I have taken the job title Chief Dot Joiner and I took that very much as tongue in cheek. My point is that we don't need to create yet another top-down industry initiative. There are just hundreds of amazing grassroots initiatives that work with diverse, underrepresented people. And how about if we were just to enable them to do so much more together? So that's what Building People does. We, we aggregate opportunities, we connect people, we support the organisations that work at grassroots level, and we are passionate about joining those dots. Thank you. Uh, Neil, if I can ask you to uh, introduce yourself and, and briefly describe how you support the underrepresented. Sure. So uh, I'm Neil Onions. Um, I'm the founder of Beyond the Box Consultants, CIC. Um, we do that by co-designing. So we don't think that we've got the answers. So we don't design solutions for underrepresented people without them actually co-designing the solution with us. Otherwise, we think it's ineffective. So that's probably an overview of what, what we do. Thank you. And uh, Deborah, you're with us as well, Deborah Williams. If you can uh, briefly describe yourself, uh, introduce yourself and describe how you support the underrepresented. Um, so I'm the founder of the Women's Association uh, and we simply exist to break barriers that prevent women and girls from having the freedom to dream or the tools to create authentically. Um, we have a number of different initiatives and programmes we do with girls in different communities and uh, very similar to uh, the previous guest, we work with them to help design the programmes that they feel they need um, to help really move things forward for them when it comes to how they navigate from education to employment. So Deborah, you don't uh, specifically work in, in architecture in the built environment. Deborah's another guest brought on to, to help show sort of the wider pieces of work that are going on that architecture in the built environment can benefit from. So tell me a little bit more about uh, the Women's Association and some of those programmes that you run. Yeah, so I set up the Women's Association in 2019 and um, it was basically off the back of a series of research projects that I had done and events that I had done and the sole purpose of the events was to bridge the gap between women in the professional world and girls in education and I just kept hearing the same thing there was a similar theme which was I feel weighed down or I feel held back because of other people's expectations of, of who I should be and what I should be doing at a certain age and for me I felt like that was really a, a great place to start and so this idea of being your authentic self kept coming back to me uh, through different people. And so that's why I set up the Women's Association, just to enable and support women and girls on their journey of being their authentic self. And we started off with a programme called the Executive Challenge, where we give girls between the age of 12 to 17 access into the business world um, in three parts. They get to speak to an executive, um, they get mentored for six months and they get an executive experience which is where they'll be presented with a problem and then by the third day they have to um, make an executive decision on how to solve that problem and one of the reasons I did that is because we work predominantly with black girls and uh, a number of them are from low lower socioeconomic backgrounds and a lot of the conversations I was having with them was we need access but beyond just having access we need support on how to navigate the access um, and so they were telling me stories of they've been mentored, they've had work experience, but they didn't really know how to get the most out of the experience. Um, and so we give them that. We work with them before they have the experience, during the experience and even after to make sure it's like a long lived process of support and empowerment. Yes, sounds amazing. And uh, uh, Rebecca, when you look at your dot joining, is that kind of part of, of that experience to be able to support people to get the most out of the experiences that they might get as well. 
Yeah, I mean, a key thing, we use the language enabling equality of opportunity across a fragmented careers landscape. And, and a key thing is helping people find organisations like the Women's Association. It's really difficult when you search the web to find this multitude of support that is actually out there that is available. So that is a key part of what we do is enabling that understanding of what's available for the user, for the individual, but then also supporting the organisations to come together to collaborate. And we, we have a challenge for next year, which is to deliver coordinated, consistent and collective careers action, which is the request from our network. So on the one hand, it's how we can help the user navigate the, that fragmented landscape. So to find work opportunities, to find events, to find resources, but vitally to find these organisations, but then also to add value to those organisations so they in turn can benefit from the aggregation that we do, bringing everything together. Can you describe a bit of a journey for say someone, I don't know, uh, say say one of, one of the 17 year olds who, who might um, experience, uh, you know, uh, Deborah's uh, uh, programme and, and they, they think yes the built environments for me what what might the experience be if they come to to your website or your, your organization so I'm, I'm going to describe where we're going so we, we are at startup stage and what we have done is we've created the evidence of what can be and, and our request now is across the whole of the sector join in join in by sharing these opportunities so the the individual where we'll be right now certainly we haven't we have more than a good substantial offer but it would be I am this sort of individual um, with this particular background and I'm looking for this sort of opportunity. And then what building people can do, it can say, right, well, are you aware of Black Females in Architecture? There's an organisation that could support you um, or maybe the St Stephen Lawrence Foundation. Um, we would then be driving the traffic towards the organisations that can help. But at the same time, here is a list of opportunities. So from work experience to apprenticeships, internship jobs. Also here are some relevant events that could be of interest to you. And whilst you're here, what about these resources? So recordings of podcasts, webinars, case studies, a day in the life of clips on YouTube. It's a simple aggregator. So the, that individual coming to us can easily access, we're simplifying that user journey, but they can access this multitude of opportunities without sitting there. And if, if you Google women in construction, um, you don't find the 80 plus organizations that we've already found. So we, we're simplifying that and making it much, much easier. That's certainly where we are now. And when we get there in the future, it's going to be phenomenal. Hopefully amongst your resources is Reba Radio. Uh, <laughs> of course. Um, Neil, if I can ask you about, you know, the kind of um, collaboration that you do in order to support the underrepresented. You talked about design being very much about listening to those voices. Yeah, absolutely. We do it across a number of, of different platforms, really. So we work really closely with architectural practices um, to design social value programs that really engage with communities and young people on location, knowing that that community has the answers and solutions for what that community needs. So we do a lot of collaboration there, um, but we also do it through a creative lens. So actually, how do we really engage young people um, in the built environment if they're not necessarily wanting a career in the built environment? They can still have a say in how their community is being shaped or how those public services are being shaped, but they might want to do that through a radio broadcast or podcast series, which is happening on Broadwater Farm Estate at the moment with the youth collective we're working with. They're interviewing their peers and their fellow residents to find out what they want. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> needs a radio, I'll lean in. Um, and another way that we're doing that is who we're actually collaborating with. So as a community interest company, the remuneration of fees, we ensure goes back into the community. So we actually pay some of the young community members that we work with to work with us. Um, and then also those that we collaborate with in terms of local creative organizations, local architecture practices, emerging collectives, the recent, the recent People's Pavilion, um, the Poor Collective supported them on their journey. They supported us with their insight, their experience and their knowledge. That inspired a whole generation of young people to actually engage in the built environment. As I say, even if they're not sure at that point, the architectural design is what they actually want to go into in terms of a career. Um, Deborah, money. <laughs> 
um, uh, it, it's 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 uh, a, a key part really of 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 the whole the economics behind supporting our underrepresented is maybe not quite what it should be. How do you, how do you navigate the finances around supporting these women? Uh, so I guess. Our strategy is to work with uh, corporates to fund uh, most of the programmes that we do. We're also building relationships with councils. So we started a relationship with Lambeth Council um, to fund us to work with some of the schools in the council because ultimately the, the people that we are serving don't have the money to fund what we're delivering to them that they have said that they need. Um, and that's where one of the biggest fundamental problems is. And, when you speak to, we recently, for International Day of the Girl, we launched the Girls Association, which is a network of girls that come together to have events, to have conversations, um, and they take that into their schools. And um, when we speak to them, they talk about the fact that they want school to be kind of a place where they can develop their whole self, not just their academics and, and um, their grades. But when we speak to schools, they don't have the funding to provide that extra support. And then when we speak to corporates, it's kind of like, well, a lot of the people that we're getting applying for the roles don't have the skills needed to take on the jobs. So, OK, if we all identify the problem, who's going to fund the solution? And a lot of the time it's down with the corporates because they have most of the money and they're going to be looking for the people that's going to take over the roles that they're in. So that's kind of my main uh, um, kind of solution right now and how I attack that problem um, but again myself I never planned to be someone that was running a business it just kind of fell into my lap um, and it was literally like a a, a burden but a, a burden of passion that I'd never experienced before and so for me having money conversations was so difficult until the point that I said okay this is going to be my full-time thing so I'm just going to have to get over the difficulty um, but also the girls and the women I was talking to really need what I feel I'm creating. And so I can't allow the discomfort of speaking about money to stop me from creating what I feel they need to progress. And so that's kind of how I tackle it. Um, but yeah. Deborah Williams, uh, Rebecca Lovelace and Neil Onions, we're talking about CQ Action supporting the underrepresented. And we'll hear more from them after years and years and shine. You're listening to Reba Radio. Real inclusive, brilliant action. Reba members get access to hundreds of online professional features and thousands of online articles with free subscription to the Reba Journal. Join Reba today and get the rest of 2021 for free. Today, our final My Soundtrack is with Joni Tyler, who's the long serving Reba head of CPD. She says, her own word, she's been here decades. Her role is to support architects to be skilled and competent. Um, and she's been doing that for, like I say, quite some time. Uh, she was born in Ohio. She studied at uh, Berkeley where she did a radio show. Uh, so it just seemed like the natural thing to do to, to ask her to contribute to Reba Radio. She says she has too many favourite musical artists and albums to choose from, but she does revisit Loveless by My Bloody Valentine more than any other. So you can hear that al al along with a lot of her stories a little bit later on between five and six. Earlier, we were talking about adaptations that work with Siraj Mitha, Amy Francis Smith, Annette Fisher and Dr. Uh, Professor Katrina Jackman. If you missed it, indeed you haven't. Uh, not only will we have all of our content subtitled and up on the Reba YouTube channel as soon as we can manage it, manage it, but we're repeating all content on this listen link after we come off air. We'll be repeating all the content until the new year and you can download the Reba radio app from Google Play to listen whenever you like from your Android device. We've got Rebecca Lovelace, Neil Onions and Deborah Williams with us talking about CQ Action supporting the underrepresented. And before years and years there, um, Deborah was really clearly talking about how she's trying to navigate this relationship with money in order to support the underrepresented. And you were nodding away there, uh, Rebecca. This seems like a very familiar sort of journey for you as well. I, I found it so hard not to leap in and just shout, yes, it's so wrong. I get, to be honest, really irate, Marsha, when we come onto the topic of, of funding. Every organisation I know is scrabbling around, trying to find funding, trying to find security. 
And it, it's just in an industry that is talking about the real problems we have around diverse inclusion and professing this real desire to become more diverse and more inclusive, why is there not joined up leadership on this agenda that would support these initiatives? So, so Building People was set up um, and the same as Deborah as a community interest company, so we're not for profit. I think it's really important that we are not for profit. We have a model of a little from a lot with the from myself maybe very naive belief that if every professional body and trade association puts in a little then that would enable building people to be free for everybody but what we have is all the members in our network are all talking to pretty much the same organizations the same developers contractors consultants employers uh, asking for contributions and that's great we have to do this but wouldn't we all save so much time and energy and have so much more of a and efficient focus if the industry, the sector, and when I, when I say, I, I, I very much conflate industry and sector, but if they were to join together and have that leadership, not just at the diversity inclusion level, but across the whole piece, but particularly here to say, we can have that focus, we can support a means to ensure that each organisation can be so much more efficient and effective because we have funding and we're not walking around with the cap out, which really makes me very, very cross. <laughs> Neil, you're also nodding away there. I mean, what what are your thoughts on that? Do you consider yourself to be part of the, the sector here that could maybe create some of the um, impetus to, to create change around the funding? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, some of my background is supporting not-for-profits in accessing funding. It's a really complex and overly convoluted process. <laughs> um, the People's Pavilion is um, a classic example. You know, I was actually a freelancer at the time of running that project. Um, I don't know how we did it, but we managed to raise almost £100,000. But all of that went back into the collaborators because of that very issue. So I was trying to test the model of actually how do you sustain underrepresented diverse talent into an industry where there is no funding? available for them to test their ideas or actually work to see if something works or a new approach could be implemented when the funding just isn't there and there isn't the sharing of knowledge to support the emerging talent in how to access that funding. So we did it. I mean, the ROBA was kind enough to sponsor the People's Pavilion and that's a big thank you to Diane Small, the London Regional Director. Um, but we also launched a crowd funder and I went to corporate institutions and asked if they could use some of their CSR money. Um, and I applied for some funding in the Foundation for Future Funding. So it was really about diversifying where you go as well in terms of funding. So you, you, you can have individuals who want to support with 10 pounds, a little leads to a lot if you've got a lot of people su supporting. But there are also barriers in that, in that funding cycle as well, which I think are unnecessary. Um, and a lot of organizations that will grant awarding organizations release their 10 year strategy and it looks super inclusive and it looks fantastic and you apply with a program based on experience you think this is exactly what they're looking for and you get a no now you're used to that if you're working in that sector that they can't fund everybody but then imagine that you're 18 and you've heard about the fund and you're applying for it for the first time you get a no what does that do to your creative idea and what does it do to that individual who wants to make the difference to the drive so resilience i think is a huge part of needing to to be embedded into your practice if you're going to be a not-for-profit trying to run these incredible projects that everybody's talking about. I mean, Deborah, when you when you hear what um, what Neil has to say there, um, what's your view about you know that how the architecture and built environment sector could change the way that they think around you know being more supportive of whether it's women's association or building people or other projects to support the underrepresented. Um, I think it's just about evolving. Like, there's so much that can go into that, but what I mean by that is, or there's so much that, that can mean, but what I mean specifically is, like Neil just mentioned, there are a lot of grant organisations and also corporates that have designed their strategy for the next five to ten years, and there's that's all they want to focus on. There's so many times that I've spoken to corporates um, and it's like, okay, we're not there yet. We're going to get there soon when it comes to specifically um, like black girls um, or the black 
community. We're not there yet. Our current focus is on X route. But the reality is you can't just focus one year or the next couple of years on one group. You need to be able to adapt and listen and um, just it is so interesting to me because I feel like diversity and inclusion is a human conversation but because of the how it's been adapted and, and the political nature of the corporate world it's become like a tick box idea and a tick box exercise and so when a lot of people are looking to to solve problems it's like okay what company can we work with that will make us look good that has a lot of traction um and so a lot of times up and coming organizations that are really doing the work with the community don't get seen because they just don't have the um attract attraction to these companies i remember one meeting i had and the person asked me how many instagram followers i had um and at the time i was just like what I, i'm talking to you about girls and their future and you're asking me about instagram followers and i just didn't understand it and i just feel like there needs to be a focus and the focus needs to be on human need and when you focus on human need you won't get caught up in this elaborate um, amazing looking five-year strategy that actually doesn't really work in the second year or in the third year you'll be focusing every year on okay what are the needs this year what are the needs this month things change so much look at covid the impact that that's had on so many people no one could have imagined that that would have um, happened and so it's just being able to adapt but being able to listen to the needs of the people that we are working for because they don't always get a chance to speak out and speak in the rooms that we do but when we do speak on their behalf listen and and try to understand um the problem listening so important isn't it rebecca honestly everything that deborah's saying i'm just nodding and nodding furiously to i mean for, for me it's this there is a tendency towards parochialism, towards we're okay, we're doing this for our profession, we're doing this for our trade. And this is my argument for joined up leadership, that we need to have an approach which enables uh, enables us to move on from it's just about the USP for a particular organisation. So, so the challenge we have is, is we say to, uh, to all organisations across the built environment, from design right through to facilities management and um, demolition, we say support what we're uh, what we're doing, which is about enabling bringing together. And they say, well, that's great, but we've got our own mentoring program, or you know, we're doing our own particular thing focusing on this particular audience, and. That we have no such thing now as I think as a, lin a linear career profile. People move from role to role. They they move from professions and professions overlap, and and people move from trade tr to trades. So so I do think where we're lacking is this certainly this listening. So anybody out there listening, please do do to stop listening and start action. But it's actually it's about understanding a holistic approach where we move beyond that the parochialism of only focusing on the the part that's important to us and recognising that there are so many overlaps and so many synergies that we have to have a joined up approach towards this, this, whole, this whole challenge. Now, of course, uh, Deborah and, um, and Rebecca aren't, aren't architects, but Neil, when, when you look at the uh, sector of architecture, it's very fragmented, isn't it? It's very, a lot of small, medium sized uh, firms, a lot of sole uh, traders as well. Um, how can there be this joint up approach, do you think, that Rebecca's talking about when it is inherent in, in the sector to go out and do your own thing? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. I wish we, you had another hour slot for this. Um, I mean, first of all, I'm not an architect either, uh, just to put that there. Um, a lot of the work I've done over the years in working with um, diverse led startups, SMEs um, within the built environment has led to a lot of larger architecture practices now starting to turn to us as an organization. So, you know, do you, do you know who's out there? And what's driving that, if people are being really honest, is a requirement now within a procurement framework for a lot of these larger architecture practices to ensure that they are supporting smaller SMEs. Some have been leading the way in a genuine um, way for quite a while and others you can tell and now okay well this is now a requirement and we need to operate and that's quite obvious 
because why don't you have those relationships with these smaller SMEs that we're talking about? Because there are endless events and opportunities and programs, um, many of which are also held here at the ROBA. And you had Annette Fisher on earlier who's doing some you know, fantastic work. So where are those architecture practices that are saying, oh, we, we just don't seem to know who's coming through and who's emerging. And I use that privilege I have as a white man to say, actually, you need to ask yourself that question. Why don't you know? <laughs> yeah, what, what, why aren't you coming into these spaces? Why aren't you engaging in these conversations? Because therefore you will start working naturally with a wider group of architects, designers that can come onto your team. So that was actually something else we were trying to model with the People's Pavilion project that we did at Here East was who is in our team? Who, how can we support both the young person who wants to be a designer, the small emerging practices who actually need that break to say, yeah, we curated a, a, an exhibition and you've got that on your CV because that also helps with funding and it helps you create a track record just by giving that platform right the way through to which practices stepped forward and supported it financially. So I think for me, there needs to be a lot more um, transparency and, and, and openness. And I know the Paradigm Network really well. They, who I know Yemi was, was on earlier in the week. Um, and they'll speak quite openly around the practices that they're leading like Tara and Lanray are behind, that they are now in more of a powerful position to be able to choose and select who they work with. And that paradigm shift is actually something that's fantastic to see taking place. Marcia, can I, yeah, go. Can I just chip, chip in? I, I just think Neil's point about procurement and the, the diversity inclusion agenda is absolutely vital. You know, if not now, when? So when I started in, in the sector, terrifyingly 20 years ago, the talk was all about um, instant and injury free, the so safety on site. And then it moved to environmental sustainability and then to CSR. And now it's on diversity, inclusion and social impact, social value. And it's being driven from the top. So when in public procurement requirements, when the clients are saying this, that there's, and it gets pushed down through the supply chain, that there's no place to hide. Well, there, sadly there is, but there's no excuse. And if we can't do this now, when we have these drivers from the top, we have a real recognition, we have you know, the, the Me Too, Black Lives Matter, and, and that's, I think, my real frustration is, is if we can't come together and recognize all of these opportunities and support them to deliver what they, you know, all that they can deliver, then when? It, it, is, it is now. And this, I think, is the call to action from all of us. If, if not now, when? Thanks so much to Rebecca Lovelace, Neil Onions and Deborah Williams for talking to us about CQ Action, supporting the underrepresented. You're listening to Reba Radio, real inclusive, brilliant action with Marsha Remu. RIBA collections. Once uh, when I was asking Corbusier, what is the truth? He drew two lines. He said, these are the two banks. And he said, do you know, the truth lies between the two and flows. It can never touch the bank. It's not about curvature. It's really about how you can invent a new environment. I did Shell headquarters in Singapore and they were delighted. They told me that Shell London would never consider a woman. So your battle, ladies, is on. You've just heard the voices of Balkrishna Doshi, Zaha Hadid and Jane Drew. For more historic talks telling architect stories in their own words through the RIBA collections, visit soundcloud.com forward slash the dash RIBA. Now, another person who's doing great work in this space of supporting the underrepresented is Dana Walkoff, built by us. And she couldn't be with us live, but we sat down for a chat last week and I started by asking her, who is Dana Walker? Dana Walker? Um, it sounds very strange to speak in third person, doesn't it? Um, but basically, I'm someone who's worked in construction um, since leaving school, um, which was quite unusual um, for the time. I went straight in from an all-girls school to being an electrician in an all-male um, environment, and from there moved on to um, working in architecture. Um, but there was certainly a common thread through all of those experiences, which was the lack of diversity, the lack of people who kind of reflected my lived experience or who looked like me. Um, that really inspired me to create something called Built By Us. So Built By Us is a social enterprise and basically we want to make change. Um, so this is something that 
even prior to Built by Us, I was really passionate about working with the RIBA through Architects for Change and through other organisations to, um, to grow representation, to grow the diversity, to grow inclusion, because I think having diverse voices around the table means that we get better outcomes in our built environment. So you talked about some of those lived experiences and some of the, mm. the, the challenges you faced. Do you mind sort of sharing a little bit about what, what that was like? Yeah, well, I think there are two perspectives on this. I think, firstly, there's the experience of actually going through the process. So as someone who comes from, I guess, a working class family on quite a low income, um, it isn't expected now still, I think, and back then, um, that a professional career would be open for you. And it's not easy. And I have to admit, you know, I ask myself quite often, given the current landscape of needing to pay around £9,000 a year in fees, would I have made the same choice? Um, so I think there are some challenges in terms of bringing the, the widest talent pool into um, the sector. And for me, that was one of the reasons I chose to be an electrician first, because having a trade would mean that I would have basically a safety net. So, you know, where is the um, safety net? Where are the pathways for people who are not from more privileged or more wealthy um, backgrounds? And then the other perspective, I would say, you know, having worked as an electrician, I was working for the local authority. So I was often working on projects that um, where we had social um, housing and that kind of thing. So you could see the impact of those designs of the built environment on um, working class uh, people, you know, um, access to pay, play space, having good quality um, schools and homes. And that's one of the reasons when I got into practice, I wanted to work for a practice that focused on housing, focused on education, because it's like, ah, I need to be in there to um, help, I hope, to make a difference. You're one of many people who said that if they had to start architecture training today, that they would think twice because of the cost involved. And that's a real barrier, isn't it? So tell me about Built by Us and, and, and what sort of difference you're trying to make with Built by Us uh, within the built environment and certainly around supporting the underrepresented? Well, Built by Us um, takes a kind of holistic approach. So I think first things, um, we are PAM professionals, so we work right across the built environment profession, so not just architects, uh, although we have lots of amazing um, architects and students taking part. Um, the other thing is that we're kind of multi-stranded, intersectional, um, in our approach as well. So we look at underrepresentation across the piece. Um, so that's gender, that's sexual orientation, that's ethnicity, that's disability. You know, it's a whole um, spectrum um, in terms of how we see diversity. Our vision is a world built by all for all. As simple as that. Um, many of us, as we, you know, change through our lives, you know, if you are a parent and you've ever tried to get from one side of London to another with a push chair and shopping and all the, we know that the built environment presents challenges. Um, if um, disability um, as well in terms of your um, lived experience, everything that we do is touched by the built environment. Um, and again, I think you know, it's incredibly important that we recognise that and make changes to the design of our built environment so it can be even more accessible. So that's what Built by Us is engaged in. Um, so we do this in three ways. Um, there's advocacy. So we talk about these sorts of issues. Um, there is the work that we do with individuals. So we run a number of mentoring um, programs, learning programs. So whether you're right at the beginning of your career, considering your options, right through to being a budding entrepreneur, we have something for you in terms of um, support and opportunities to learn. Um, and I think the other key area of work is working with organizations who are also thinking about these challenges. How can we be allies? How can we help? How can we make change in our businesses that affect the individuals who want to contribute, who want to work in the sector, um, but also to the communities that we serve. You know, as a um, sector, we are serving society. We do not at present reflect society. So if an organisation comes to you and says, we want to work with you, you know, can you can you help us? What does that involve? 
it can involve a whole range of things. So, you know, I'm a big kind of advocate for meeting people where they are. People are in different places on this um, journey and also in the discussion on um, equity, diversity and inclusion. Um, so for some organisations, it's thinking through what their strategy um, might be in their action plan. For others, it's, well, actually, we really need to learn. We need a better understanding and awareness of the challenges. Um, and for many who are now thinking, well, actually, we haven't, you know, we're not diverse as an organisation. Where can we access um, that diverse talent? What can we do better in terms of attracting a wider range of people? Um, so that's the whole range of things that we might involved in uh, be involved in rather um, with organisations. So an organisation's got involved with you, they've started to engage and they're starting to um, do things differently, say. Um, how do you track that change? Are there any particular measures that you put in place to be able to see progress? That is a great question, because I think measuring is key to this. What lots of organisations do, and they do it um, with good intentions, is to jump straight into activity um, and some sort of intervention. Um, they may do it for a year, they may do it for longer or less in some cases, but then at the end, they're not quite sure whether they've made the impact that they want to. So I think it's really important to establish right from the beginning what those metrics are, what success looks like for you. Um, in, in terms of the um, organisation, but also for the people um, that you want to affect. So if it's things like um, trying to attract um, a more diverse workforce, then of course we have the baseline of that sort of demographic measurement data um, for the organisation. Um, but there are other ways that we can think about um, tracking. And I think a really important part of this is the things that people experience. It would be a mistake for us as a sector to go, oh, this is great. We've got so much diversity, but we don't keep people. And we don't keep people because their experience isn't a great one. If they're hearing language, if they're seeing behaviour that doesn't feel supportive, that doesn't feel inclusive, they will leave. So it's really important that we're both getting that kind of quantitative, but also qualitative data. And so, um, you know, Again, our fictitious organisation has come to you, it's doing this work, it's measuring it. What are the kind of outcomes that you like to see when you're working with an organisation? Oh, this is a great question. Um, I love to see that um, diversity and inclusion has been taken on by the leadership or executive team as something core. Um, to their activity, not a nice to do, not a, oh, we've given that to Sandra to try and sort out on top of her full time role. Um, it's something that they see as um, a part of everything that they do and it's owned by them. I also like to see um, a focus on not only attraction, but progression. Um, because I think this is another challenge for us. We don't necessarily have as many role models at leadership level. It's amazing how many people in the 21st century are still joining my mentoring um, programs or built by us as mentoring programs and saying, I can't see anyone at that upper level who's like me. You know, it's making me wonder whether, you know, in terms of progression, in terms of the future, I can truly see myself there. And I think people underestimate the impact and power that having diverse role models, um, having people who um, are challenging the status quo um, in leadership roles. So I'd love to see that. Um, I also really love to see, goodness, I'm writing a very big wish list here, um, but I think that one of the things that we could do better is around our kind of management and lead leadership preparation. Um, we are a sector that loves to throw people in at the deep end, you know, let's see what happens if we promote them. Hopefully um, they will be OK. But actually, we can do a lot more in terms of um, supporting people, exploring um, leadership styles um, and challenging um, people to learn. Um, not just because you're able to deliver a project, say, now you're in charge of people. They're very, very different skill sets. I'm, I'm laughing because I, I just have recognised this in the few months that I've been in the sector. That's really quite significantly uh, 
uh, something that I picked up on. Um, mm. So, Dana, if if you could say, you know, you, this is this is an opportunity for you and and the sector to sort of come together. What in what ways can they engage with you and and take their EDI and uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion um, plans forward with, with an organisation like Built by Us? Or, um, you know, this is what we exist for. You know, there would be no point for us to kind of be working away in a kind of little bubble. We really need um, the sector to be very much part of this. So um, engaging with us um, through the services and support um, that we can provide, um, but also recognising the um, opportunity to be allies. So joining as um, mentors and supporters of the programmes, you know, this is the way that we're going to kind of supersize our impact and our um, effect. We've got a lot to do because we have kept this on the nice to do list for so long. Um, however, I am truly encouraged by the sheer number of practices, the fact that we are having this conversation, um, the fact that um, professional bodies, um, um, sector leaders and organisations from, you know, 10 people right up to thousands of people are going, we can do more you know, let's work out how we can do it. And I'm so, so pleased that Built by Us is there as one of the organisations that says yes, and this is how. Dana Walker of Built by Us uh, sharing her approach and support for the underrepresented in the built environment. You're listening to Reba Radio. Coming up, we're talking inclusive outcomes with Hikaru Nisanka, Arthur Mamumani and Mark Nagel. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects, with me, Marsha Ramrup. I'm the Director of Inclusion here. You know, I'm looking at my piece of paper like I don't know that was the job that I do. Uh, we're 26 hours down, unbelievably. Uh, we've only got Got two hours to go. We're nearing the end in bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. It's all rooted in this behavioural principle of CQ cultural intelligence. We've spoken about adaptations at work. We've spoken about supporting the underrepresented. Now we're going to talk inclusive outcomes, those sweet solutions, uh, with a final pan panel later from the RIBA alongside the ARB. We're taking CQ action. Welcome to the final day of Reba Radio. Reba Radio with Marsha Remu. You are listening to the final day of live broadcasting on Reba Radio. We're live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, where you can hear the atmosphere, people moving, they're walking around, they're working here at the headquarters of the Royal Institute of British Architects. I'm Marsha Ramroop, the Director of Inclusion here. Now, team, team, we've had a bit of practice. So let's see if you can really get this coordinated now. Come on, come on. This is like one of the final times. So we've been bringing you... 28 hours! ...of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And what's it rooted in? The principle of CQ! And what does CQ stand for? Cultural intelligence! Woo! Cultural intelligence is the capability to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you. And it's broken down into these four strands. Drive, knowledge, strategy and action. And we've been taking you through the journey of those four. And today it's CQ Action Day, the final CQ capability. We have to act. We have to be adaptable in order to be effective at working and relating with others. And that means looking at inclusive outcomes. And we're doing that with Hikaru Nisanka, Arthur Mamumani and Mark Nagel. And later we'll be looking forward uh, the RIBA alongside the ARB about the future and inclusion in the sector. All after we hear from... Hi, I'm Joni Tyler. I'm head of CPD at Reba. I'm looking forward to joining you today at five o'clock on Reba Radio when I share my especially selected soundtrack of music I really love. See you later today on Reba Radio. Sweet solutions. Oh yeah. 
We're talking Squeak Solutions as we talk about CQ Action because it's about being adaptable, taking the actions to be supportive of the underrepresented and by being mindful of their needs and reactions and getting great outcomes. To speak about this, I'm joined by Hikaru Nisanka, uh, Arthur Mamumani and Mark Nagel, who all work in the architecture sector. So um, Hikaru, I'd like to start with you. I'll call you Hik if that's OK. And um, by I'll start by asking you, how would you describe yourself in terms of your work and, and who you are? And how do you disrupt the status quo to shape our lives? <laughs> um, so I'm a director of an architecture practice called Irma Max. Um, and also historically I've done quite a lot of teaching over the last 10 years at various institutes um, from Cambridge, UCL, AA, those sorts of places. Um, in terms of the specific topic, I mean, I do my best, I think, as any, as any responsible human kind of does. Um, one hopes. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure what you, how, how better to answer it. Yeah. That's a quote from you, by the way, on your website. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> Arthur Mami Mani, how would you describe yourself and what does inclusivity look like for you? Ah, um, I'm an architect. I'm also a teacher. Um, and I also have a fabrication studio where, where we also link design and making. Um, inclusivity, I see it uh, as a sort of term that goes even beyond us, beyond humans. I see inclusion of nature, inclusion of ecosystems, uh, trying to strike a balance uh, between different perspectives. Thank you. Mark, how would you describe yourself and why is it important to you to make the industry a better place? Good question, Marcia. Good morning to you. Um, yeah, so I just, I'm operations director for an architectural recruitment company called Urban. Um, so we're official recruitment partners of Blueprint for All. Um, we set up the, the Be More Inclusive initiative together. And um, in terms of kind of my thoughts on, on making the industry more inclusive, I think I, I've worked in architectural recruitment since 2005. But I think what's been really clear throughout that time is that uh, the, 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 the level of representation really hasn't improved, particularly over that period. Um, so. I think in terms of what we try to do is just work with Blueprint for All to try and, you know, disrupt how things have been done, to do things a little bit differently in order to try and affect genuine positive change. Arthur, when you're looking at, you know, you talked about inclusivity being so many different things, so many different facets. Um, when you're trying to create inclusivity, what does that look like for you? I think... I. I think I don't know that one can create inclusivity. One can just be more sensitive to letting it come to you because inclusivity is about being open and being um, basically a better listener, <laughs> being able to understand that reality can be different than you and that it can have its own contradictory views and being able to accept that and not take it personally is, is I think core to accepting difference. And uh, Hick, you, you, that disrupting the status quo, just to tease you about. Um, <laughs> I actually uh, got you there. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Hick, what, 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 when is, is inclusive, inclusivity for you about disrupting that, that status quo? Is there a sense that the status quo isn't inclusive? Well, for sure. I mean, you just have to look at the profession and it's absolutely not inclusive. Um, I would say that... Um, yeah, one works very hard at doing these things, whether it's setting up organizations at universities to tackle issues of race, of gender, of basically inequality in, in general. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange thing because I think there's a lot of inertia in our industry to actually change. And a lot of that change is being driven by, met, by clients essentially requiring a kind of broader ethical shift in society and clients requiring architects to behave more ethically, have more diverse employment um, and these sorts of things. And the profession is following um, suit some practices much better than others. Um, yeah, but yeah, um, my part is, you know, one part with broader, uh, a larger group of professionals, I think, who are, who are trying to push for change and strive for this change through measurable outcomes. 
Do you mind sharing a bit of your personal journey in terms of when things have been inclusive and when they haven't been for you? Um, I mean, I, I should be quite blunt and kind of honest, you know, I come from quite a privileged background. I'm a person of colour, but um, I was found that, you know, beyond kind of stories of when I was a child and people would say racist things to me and these sorts of things, I had a fairly smooth and easy ride compared to a lot of other people. Um, I just say, um, but yeah, um, a lot of my students have spoken about um, a lot of kind of tough, racist, um, bullying kind of behavior based around race, gender, um, you know, all sorts of, all manner of kind of things. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't disclose their stories <laughs> confidential I guess that's that true, but yeah. yeah so um uh, Mark you, you know this the these stories that um mm. uh, he mentions I mean we I'm sure we're all really familiar with some of the real horror stories that exist but you're trying yeah. to turn that into something different trying to create different outcomes so can you talk about that partnership between urban and blueprint for all yeah absolutely um so um as an organization we've worked with blueprint for all for a number of years and initially that was started off uh, in the fundraising capacity for them because i think we felt inclusion is a core part of sort of my personal values is a values of our organization uh, and we started working blueprint for all initially as i say doing fundraising different sort of charity events uh, on an annual basis uh, to raise money for them but what became clear really is that the synergy between the work the blueprint for all do and what we do then we could add more value than simply fundraising um so as you know with, with blueprint for the work they do and the magnificent work they do is, is working with young people uh, from underrepresented communities uh and really help them through, through mentoring through networking through financial support uh, help them pursue their dreams and um and, and enter the the architectural industry um the work that blueprint will do typically is, is helping those people probably up to the age of 21 really so when they finish their degree uh, and then on that whole build up time from there but one thing i can i've seen it has been the case in the architecture industry certainly since i've recruited it is that to get into it and, and the same for most chartered professions really it's, it's often about who you know and so if you are from perhaps a community where it, it you're not represented as fully as others it, it's, it's difficult to to get that first footing in um so with that in mind at the end of, sort of 2019 uh sat down with with sonia uh, watson at blueprint for all and the team there and we discussed how we could work together to to kind of um, make more of a positive, take positive action really and make a real genuine sustained change and we developed a Be More Inclusive initiative. So the Be More Inclusive initiative, to give you a bit of detail about that, essentially uh, primarily that's working with graduates and uh, graduates who come from black and minority backgrounds exclusively. Um, and we work with them from the, the point that they've qualified, they've completed, as in, so it's on their degree um, and help them get their first footing into the industry because as I say, that, that often can be the most difficult step and we, we work with them in terms of cv writing advice portfolio uh, so advice interview coaching uh, even how they can use their social media profile to to really help them uh, achieve a career in architecture and sell themselves as effectively as possible uh, then we we work with firms that have signed up to our be more inclusive initiatives and firms that share our values and inclusion and, and actively looking to try and make a change um, and we we work with these young people when they're ready to represent them in terms of to help them get that first footing into the industry their first job in the industry um and, and the way we do that is we we file our services completely free of charge a pro bono service for that uh, but just ask the recruiting company to make a donation of a thousand pounds to blueprint for which then, then they can put back together for for more young people to kind of come through the program basically um uh, and look to try and create that 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 real sort of sustainable sort of chain um which, which can make a big difference Sounds extraordinary, and I'll, I'll ask you a little bit more about it in a moment. But um, Arthur, when you're um, describing uh, your your own practice, you you what you describe tends to be quite an inclusive place. How do you think you've achieved that? By being curious and understanding that when you design, you are a group of person that bring different perspective onto. Um, something that will be shared civically with the public and therefore we are not imposing one ego onto um, a project but we are a multiplicity of perspective 
sharing something that will be anyways inhabited by many people um, of different backgrounds of um, and, and so it's really really important to understand the collaborative nature of what architecture has to offer and therefore it has by essence to be inclusive because otherwise it, it, it doesn't work even as a building if it's something that rejects people or where you don't feel welcome then I don't think it's good architecture in general. So <laughs> the essence of our approach is really to understand that there is no one truth or one reality, but that everyone can perceive things differently. And, and if that's the case, then we have to have diversity in our office for that. And how do you um, appreciate difference? I mean, what, what is it about all the different people that you really value? So difference is, is like, I would see as um, it could be anything. I mean, of course, we, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion about race, but I think it's also where are you from? How do you see the world? What's your religion or what's your background? My parents used to always argue <laughs> because my dad is Jewish, my mom is Catholic, and they kept on arguing about is God a loving God? Is he not? Is, was Moses right? Was Jesus right? Like, basically, they were not... Um, afraid to debate their truth and to confront them so that they would see what's good in every um, background or in every ritual or in every tradition. Um, and so this ability to discuss and be open with your wisdom or your um, sort of ancestral wisdoms uh, with an S <laughs> is something that I find really helpful when talking about inclusivity, this ability to discuss and listen. Hick, do you think that that ability to discuss and listen exists well enough in architecture at the moment? No, not really. <laughs> On topics of, I mean, we, we've advanced conversations around gender. I think there were big campaigns around that. Now race, it seems very slow. Um, we barely have a discussion around disability, around sexuality, around um, there is com conversations around economic background, but there are no, no real attempt like action to take down the barriers, just the cost of education and living um, to really tackle those things beyond kind of attempts at scholarship programs. Of course, a lot of these are broader societal and issues that we're kind of a part of, but also I would say our profession is particularly bad when it comes to things like, um, well, all things, but particularly dis disability. Um, so yeah, I'm less, um, less hopeful actually. I'm, I'm pleased to see the changes that we're beginning to see, but I think it's very little, very late. Um, and the God is in, you know, what is it? God is in the detail or whatever, you know, a lot of it is coming down to the small print and fine print of policies, um, that, and how they're actioned and not just written up, um, which, yeah, we're still waiting to see whether that's actually happening. And Mark, you're, uh, you, you uh, have a, an intervention, as it were, at, at part one stage after that initial mm. going, uh, having completed that first part of the degree. I mean, is there more that can be done that you can see can be done before that? I think so, yeah. I think that the, the firms that I'm working with, and obviously I work with uh, a lot of architecture firms, um, like Hick said, some perhaps more bought into and engaged and tried to create, uh, you know, genuine inclusive cultures than others. But the, the best ones really are uh, getting out there and engaging with communities with young people. Um, they're, they're promoting sort of the benefits of, uh, you know, what, what it's like to be an architect and showing that it is, it's not beyond uh, aspiration in order to do that. Um, they're working for organisations. I know you had Neil Onions on here earlier, working with people like Beyond the Box and just, you know, being heavily involved in the community side of it. But I think in terms of, I think something which is really important and to build on Hicks point really is obviously the, I think the education route within architecture and just the costs involved with that, the time scales of the, uh, the, the, the to, to become fully qualified as an architect, it's so prohibitive, isn't it, to, to people who perhaps haven't got a particularly sort of wealthy uh, background and uh, the ability to be able to do that. Um, so I think one thing uh, I'd recommend firms to do, and I think we need to be adopted more so across the industry is, is high, more focused upon like, the architectural apprenticeship route, for example, and that could be done obviously before 21 at level six apprenticeship, uh, and then beyond that for the part two, part three, uh, you know, that, that, I think that's invaluable um, sort of as a way forward to really help make this industry more inclusive. I'm speaking to Hikaru uh, Nisanka, Arta Mamumani and Mark Nagel about inclusive outcomes. And we'll have more from them after Celeste. 
and stop this flame. As a REBA member, you can access our free advice line and get expert opinion when you need it. Join the REBA today and get the rest of 2021 for free. We'll be looking forward uh, in the next and final hour. The final hour of Reba Radio. Uh, it will be uh, the RIBA alongside the ARB talking about the future and inclusion in the sector. And that's going to be with Alan Valance, the CEO of Reba, Jack Pringle, who's the chair of the board of Reba, Rebecca Roberts Hughes, who's the director of policy and communications at the ARB, uh, Sarah Akigbogan, a council member for Reba, and of course, course I'll be joining in too. I'll be holding myself accountable as a director of inclusion at the RIBA. In the last hour we were speaking to Rebecca Lovelace, Neil Onions and Deborah Williams about CQ Action supporting the underrepresented. If you missed it, you haven't missed it because not only will we have all of our content subtitled and up on the Reba YouTube channel as soon as we can manage it, but we are repeating all content on this listen link after we come off air. Uh, we'll be repeating all the content up until the new year and you can download the Reba radio app. We have an app now, people, uh, which you, if you go to Google Play, search Reba Radio. You can listen whenever you like on your Android device. So what we're planning on doing is last Thursday's content, we're going to repeat on Saturdays. Uh, last Friday's content, we're going to repeat on Sundays. And then the Monday to Friday content is going to re be repeated as Monday to Friday on a Monday to Friday. So that will be available from uh, after we come off air today at one o'clock uh, through until uh, the new year. So have a listen out for that. If you missed any of it, you can pick up on it. And in the meantime, we're going to be working on the speech only podcast content. So that will be available for you in the new year. And like I say, uh, we're making sure that the subtitling is accurate and accessible on uh, Reba YouTube. So bear with us whilst we pull that together. Together. I'm speaking to Hikaru Nisanka, uh, Arthur Mamumani and Mark Nagel about inclusive outcomes. And Mark, before we went to that great track by Celeste, um, you were talking about, uh, you know, some of those different pathways into the profession. Can you expand a little bit more on that and on what you've seen that look like uh, from your perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think certainly the the apprenticeship route obviously seems to be the sort of the, the key new pathway into the industry. And I think certainly uh, I've really picked up. We we as an organisation we do quite a lot of work with the um the London Architecture HR Network, which is run by Stephanie Warner and Amy Steen, and they, they lead that with absolute passion in terms of the race forum to try and make sustainable change and share kind of best practice across the HR network across um, across London and and the wider sort of population. Um, as part of the, their sessions, uh, they're really promoting sort of the level six and particularly level seven architectural apprenticeship route and 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 getting rid of some of the perhaps the concerns and uh, unsurety that maybe some firms might have about going down that route and utilising it. I think from from my perspective and, and obviously I talk to a lot of people um, from underrepresented communities at kind of graduate level and unsure about whether they can perhaps become a qualified architect because they're concerned about the costs involved with it. Um, obviously, I think with the current educational pathway to, to kind of do your degree, go to work for a year and then have two years where you don't get paid again, you know, that's very difficult, isn't it? So, um, and that, I, I spoke to a number of people who, who spoke about dropping out of the industry because of that. Um, so we, we work with an, uh, quite a few firms actually who have really embraced the level seven apprenticeship routes and, um, and we're also trying to do what we can to try and show how accessible that is to do it. So um, a, a few months ago or earlier this year, we, we launched a, a level seven apprenticeship uh, partnership with Karaki Switch Carson. Um, and that with that, we donated the, the, the actual fees for a level seven apprenticeship course, uh, which is 21,000 um, pounds from our apprenticeship levy. And then work, we opened this initiative up that the young people who come from black and minority backgrounds, they could apply for the level seven apprenticeship role at Carrefour Carson. Um, we would fund the course, but they would receive all of the sort of the training, the coaching, the guidance, the support from the team at, at KCA. Um, and, and, and that was really done to, to demonstrate that um, 
in architecture and in any industries you can collaborate with other organizations in order to make things happen and um, it's just trying to think it's kind of outside the box about how we can make this more normalized in terms of the apprenticeship route. Yes, because it is incredibly expensive, isn't it, to, to yeah. train to become an architect. And so mm -hmm. these kinds of, of schemes are really very important. Um, you're, you're a bit out there on your own, aren't you, Mark, doing this kind of work? Uh, we are. We are. And so uh, hopefully that will change. Um, so in, in terms of, uh, actually, I'm talking to you today, we're, I'm sat in the lobby of the Holmes Hotel, just around the corner from you in Baker Street, because last night we were at the, um, my, my team, Urban and I, we were at the, uh, uh, the, the National uh, Recruitment and Employment Confederation Awards, where we won an award for diversity champion for the whole industry. So, thank you, thank you. Um, but um, so we are out there on our own with it at the moment. But I do feel that it's something where I, I would encourage architecture firms to put more emphasis upon their suppliers, like recruitment companies, like ourselves, and ask what are we doing to try and help promote inclusion and, and diversity in the industry. Um, because obviously the, the power is there with the client side. And I think Hikaru was mentioning earlier, certainly architecture firms are getting that pressure from sort of other organisations, aren't they? I'm thinking like the B First, um, uh, Dagenham and Redbridge, for example, to ask for practices to have a, a, a workforce which is representative of the communities that they're going to be designing for. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, we are out there at the moment, but I think that, that can and, and should change. Hikaru, do, what kind of role modelling do you do you want to see from the rest of the the sector around, you know, being better at creating inclusive outcomes for underrepresented groups? Right. <laughs> Probably an acknowledgement that we're nowhere nowhere near doing enough, and we we need to learn a lot more. But we also, very importantly, need to unlearn a lot of a lot of things um, that that. Is inherent in our like inherent in our both our society and our profession um one thing that i think is really important is that with all of these changes and structural changes particularly around procurement and the requirements for it i think a lot of um practices have noticed that um a lot of the jobs seem to be going to the a few a few practices in particular um because i think they're published a lot and the bigger practices are immediately trying to just snap them up for, um, you know, to join their team on tenders and these things. I think it's really important that we move, we're, we're very careful about greenwashing bids and um, whitewashing bids and the, these sorts of things and trying to give an appearance of, of things having changed, but actually things not having changed. I think it's really important to track uh, money and power, particularly around those teams and those bids. Um, how much money is going to those practices led by women, led by people, you know, different, of all kinds of backgrounds, colour, sexuality, you know, so on and so forth. Um, because that's, I think, the only way that we're going to be truly accountable. Um, there are a lot of organisations, I think the Mayor's Office does actually require you to submit that sort of information, but there needs to be a very clear way of public procurement and privately procured projects um, weighing those things up. Um, I find myself having a lot of quite difficult conversations when we recommend people either to larger practices to join our team or to, you know, friends when I'm recommending practices of, you know, from younger generations who have different backgrounds. And a lot of it is just like they're not experienced or they don't have the experience or they don't have this or they don't have that. And it's really distressing because actually you're like, well, this is the problem. It's those structures that we're inheriting unless someone makes the first move these things will perpetuate um so yeah i would just say you know i think we all the profession is by and large means well but we have to do much more than that we, we, it has to go beyond that see so you nodding your head away there um arthur what what <laughs> in particular <laughs> Um, there's this idea of um checking yourself first i think this idea that we have to check our assumption, our convictions, and know that we might be wrong. And I, I think that's something architects don't like to do. <laughs> we have a tradition of, of ego, of, of, of sort of saying, this is, this is it, this is the manifesto. You know, we have a culture of, of, um, of imposing truth because we feel that's what a movement and a kind of um, an art movement has to be, you know, modernism, all these big isms. And so we have to kind of go out there and say truth. 
when inclusion is all about accepting that there are other truths, that there are other issues that we might not be aware of. So it all comes down to checking oneself and our own assumption and being very accurate. You said it, uh, Ikaru. I think similarly to the environmental movement, there's a lot of finger pointing, you know, there's a lot of oh, this, that, that. And, and actually we realize the stats or the, 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 the actual real numbers, they come from people having taken risky decisions, whether it's the business or, uh, you know, even financial, like being able to uh, maybe question our own business model in order to be able to finance these apprentices that you talked about, Mark, um, means that we need to re-question how even architecture can work. Because there was a tradition of having more privileged people going into the profession, maybe they didn't question their own business model. We started a fabrication space, we started raising funds, we thought a lot more entrepreneurial than what architects are meant to do. And that was a way to also help everyone have a salary this, uh, within the RBA standards and so on. Like it, it took a lot of reinventing. And I think this, this taking risk is something that the profession should, should do a little bit more of. In what way would you like them to, to take more of a risk? I mean, is it really a risk to um, embrace those who aren't, you know, from the traditional demographic? I mean, I see you nodding. Well, there. I mean, it, it, it might be like a school that is not maybe the, the best school. It might be re-questioning what it is to be good. It might be re-questioning what we assume as a, a diploma versus no diploma, or maybe being more observant of certain skills, maybe being open to the fact that someone can bring something to the, the team that is not so obvious. Um, it, it's that sort of sensitivity, what you said, the cultural, uh, the CI. <laughs> And Hick, I mean, that, that, that is a barrier, isn't it, in terms of, you know, acknowledging, you know, the education may not be from, I don't know, an elite school or, um, you know, someone coming from a slightly different perspective. I mean, in, in your experience, have you seen that the uh, apprenticeship schemes is, is having the kind of impact that you would like to see? Well, for starters, uh, yeah, um, I'd say that one shouldn't underestimate the importance of lived experience. Um, there's a huge amount of knowledge there um, that isn't a formal education of an architect that makes you a good architect, nevertheless. Um, whether you can draw well or whether you can articulate your th thoughts in a very precise manner, you know, to be honest, I don't really care because it doesn't mean that those architects have necessarily particularly designed well for the communities they profess to serve. I mean, like, uh, um, sorry, I've lost track of the original question. <laughs> I don't want to ask the different one. Um, but um, yeah, sorry, could you remind me? What... Well, basically, <laughs> I was just asking about, you know, that those different routes in, are they as accepted in the profession as they should be? No, yeah, well, I mean, like, you just have to look at, I mean, I, I know for sure, like, I was teaching at Cambridge, it's like completely undiverse, despite year on year um, having... Um, you know, news reports saying quite clearly how undiverse and how problematic it is. Um, uh, these things, yeah, I, I don't think they're changing at all, actually, to be totally honest. Um, but I mean, Mark, you mentioned the Architecture Race Forum, and I, I really mm. want to give them a shout out, actually. Yeah. If you're working in architecture, the built environment, and you're on LinkedIn, uh, if you search for the Architecture Race Forum, they are trying to bring together um, a, a collaboration, as a big a group of people, a coalition of people to create change, um, especially uh, around race, but of course, you know, intersectional uh, uh, identities in order that the um, the architecture uh, profession can be better at, uh, you know, recognising different backgrounds. Um, Mark, what, what has your interactions with them been like? Uh, the interaction with them has been outstanding. So I think they've been huge supporters of the, the Be More Inclusive initiative. I, I'm, I work regularly with uh, a, a lot of sort of the members of that. I think the passion displayed by certainly the, the leaders of that, Amy and Stephanie, is, is really, really clear, comes out. You know, they really are looking to try and make the genuine change in the industry. That's, that's so, so clear. And uh, I think in terms of kind of that impart of knowledge and sharing of information throughout that forum, it, it's invaluable. Um, and I think it's certainly over the course this year, I know, for example, and talking about the apprenticeships again, but I know that a number of firms have done that for the first time based upon the information which they picked up and they've learned from the education pieces in, in that race forum. 
Well, thanks so much to Hikaru Nisanka, Arta Mamumani and Mark Nagel talking about inclusive outcomes. We are in the midst of our Beckinshire Centenary programme, including two exhibitions at 66 Portland Place, artistic commissions, events and various learning workshops. Join us in marking the 100th anniversary of the Beckinshire Estate in East London. Head over to architecture.com forward slash Beckentry Centenary to find out more and book your slot to visit. Well, we'll be looking forward in the next and final hour of Reba Radio, uh, live that is broadcasting. Uh, it's the RIBA alongside the ARB about the future and inclusion in the sector. And we're really very fortunate to have the stellar panel that you could possibly have on this subject. So that's Alan Valence, the CEO of the RIBA, Jack Pringle, the chair of the board of the RIBA, Rebecca Roberts Hughes, who's the director. Director of Policy and Communications at the Architects Registration Board, Sarah Akigbogan, a council member. And of course, I'll be joining in too because I have to hold myself accountable uh, for what I'm trying to do here at the RIBA around inclusion. All RIBA radio, all Reba radio content will be repeated. So once we come off air at one o'clock, we're going to repeat today's output. And then on Saturdays, we're going to repeat last Thursday's output. On Sundays, we're going to repeat last fr uh, Friday's output. And then Monday to Friday will be a repeat of what's been going out live this week. So you're going to really get a real opportunity to be able to hear back, listen back if you've missed any of it. Uh, plus, if you go to Google Play, you can download the Reboot Radio app uh, so you can listen at any time on your Android device. Plus... You, we really don't want you to miss any of this content. We're going to uh, make sure that we've properly subtitled and made accessible uh, the content, which is then going to live on the Reba uh, YouTube channel. There's a special playlist called Reba Radio. So there's a videoed version on there as well. Plus, in the new year, we're, we'll make available podcasts of all the speech content. So you really will have no excuse. That'll be ready for you in January. Anyway. Imagine dragons and I'm believer. Ooh, you know what? I'm you know gonna what? I'm going to go for a, a, a walk around. Let me turn down the speakers here. Ooh, it's so exciting to be inside the bookshop. This is the foremost architectural bookshop in the world, uh, according to the £20 note that was handed to me earlier uh, by <laughs> Pete Roseman, who uh, runs a bookshop. Um, and one of the great things about being uh, in the bookshop whilst we do Reba Radio is so many of the authors and uh, the, some of the subjects around inclusion, we have the books here in the bookshop, the RIBA bookshop at 66 Portland Place. So for example, on day one, we were talking about unconscious bias and we had one of the best people in the world uh, talking about unconscious bias, Dr. Pragya Agarwal. Now she's written three books. One's called Sway, which is about unconscious bias and a lot of the stuff we were talking to her about uh, what was uh, there. And that was in the second hour of the first day. You can catch that on the Reba YouTube channel. If you go there now, uh, you'll be able to see that interview. But her two of her other books you can get here as well. So one of which is called Wish We Knew What To Say which is talking to children about race. And this is so, so important because even those of us who are from underrepresented racialized groups, sometimes we don't know, even know how to talk to our own children about some of the things that are, are, are realities of, of race in our world. And she really explains how you can have those conversations as well. But another of her books is called Motherhood. And it's about how your lives change and the perceptions of you change when you become a parent. So we've got those books as well. One of the things that we talked about was the menopause, planning for the menopause in the workplace. And uh, Deborah Garlick, who, um, uh, who's part of the um, Henpicked organisation, which helps organisations with menopause and policy planning, that book is here as well. Um, we had Samita Singer, who uh, if you don't know who she is, uh, one of the great architects who set it up, Architects for Change. Her, she has several books and they're available here as well. Uh, inclusive Design, Julie Fleck, you can get hold of that. And rebabooks.com forward slash uh, reba dash radio, you can get a discount. Yeah, exactly. I know. Why wouldn't you go to the Reba Books website to pick up some of the books that were referenced on Reba Radio? Now, 
we've got a very special guest inside the uh, <laughs> inside the um, bookshop here. Hello. We have Joni Joni Tyler. Hi, hello, hello, Marcia. <laughs> hello, hello, everybody out there in Radio Land as well. So, Joni, you're going to do my soundtrack later. I am, and I'm super excited about that. I'm going to draw on my years as a DJ, my love of London, my love of music, and my love of music of all genres. I'm going to be taking in Loretta Lynn, I'm going to be taking in my absolute favourite Ms. Dynamite, some dance music, some punk rock, and all kinds of things, and talk a little bit about my story and talk a little bit about diversity and inclusion and how important it is. Great. Well, I'm glad to hear it now, Joni. Some, you, I hear... That you've been here 20, 25 years? 25 years. I've been here 25 years. 25 yes, years. Yes, indeed. That's, 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 a, that's a long time. So, so tell me about your journey. So what brought you to the RIBA in the first place 25 years ago? Well, 25 years ago, I was looking to leave the marketing team at the NSPCC, where I'd look, worked for six years in individual direct marketing. And I came here to work in the marketing team and was quickly poached to uh, go into the CPD team to help grow the product and help grow the um, policy and help grow the idea of competence for architects on a regular basis. So along the years, I've seen the RIBA's um, journey in inclusion and diversity grow and grow and grow till we've got to the point where we are today. This isn't the end point by any means, but this has been a fantastic um, 10 days or so of amazing content that, by the way, if you're an architect or another professional, you should count as CBD as well. Oh yeah, well, count it as CBD. It's all learning. That's definitely what we're here for. So, um, you know, you, you started in the CPD team. Um, what what's kept you there for 25 years? Um, I love the RIBA. I love working here. I love my colleagues. I love this glorious building. I have had an amazing journey for 25 years, meeting great people, helping people um, in a real way to maintain their competence, pick up new skills and to make real changes. Plus, the people are fantastic. The benefits are fantastic. How could you not want to work in the middle of the West End anyway, with John Lewis around the corner? <laughs> and there's the bookshop where I'm looking for Christmas presents as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, speaking of which, uh, you can get your Christmas cards as, as well here, Joni. So uh, there, there's some full fix of images with the snow on them. Um, so, it, I mean, the, the key question when you're working in the architectural world, what's your favorite building and why? I have so many favorites, but I have to say the thing, the first thing that always comes to mind when somebody asks me the question is the um, Arab Institute building by Jean Nouvel in Paris. Absolutely beautiful. It's a modernist building, um, probably the antithesis of the RIBA building, but how it's constructed, it was constructed with hundreds upon hundreds of um, uh, ventilated windows that open um, to let automatically let in sunlight and they're based on tra traditional Islamic architecture. It's a really beautiful building. You may not be a fan, fan of modernist architecture but you like that one and it's got an amazing tea room on the top floor as well. Did you, were you a fan of architecture before you came to the RIBA? I was, I was indeed. I've loved architecture and buildings all my life. Um, I was on the point of going to an organization called the National Eczema Society when I was poached to do this. And I thought, this is perfect for me. I love this building. I love architecture. I've always been interested in architecture, design and buildings, but not just design and architecture, cities and how they work. And I'm very passionate about the idea of urban design and cities that work well for the people who use them, who live in them, work in them, study in them, inhabit them, or, or just enjoy them. So architecture and cities, it was perfect for me. And here I am 25 years later, and I came to wave to my former colleague, Rebecca Robert Hughes over there as well. Yeah, it's well, really nice to see her. Uh, we're going to be talking to Rebecca in the next hour because, of course, she's now the Director of Policy and Communications at the ARB, which we're hoping to work really closely uh, as we move forward uh, with the inclusion uh, efforts. Um, so, later, my soundtrack between 5 and 6 p.m. Right. Uh, you mentioned you've got Miss Dynamite. -hee. I love that track so much. That is just Are you my playing track. that one? I am playing that track. That is personally resonant to me for lots of reasons. And if you listen to the um, hour, you'll, you'll hear why. Uh, which stories didn't we hear? Oh, you probably didn't hear lots of stories about my time in Berkeley when I was kind of a naughty girl. Oh, go on, tell her. Oh, no, now you've opened that kind of words. Come here now. Which is a naughty girl story? Come on, tell me a naughty girl story. Well, it was just because I was doing a radio show. I was hanging out with pop stars and, and uh, musicians a lot. Ooh. And, you know, having, good, having fun, let's say, definitely. Okay, well, I can't promise you any, any good times like that here at Reba Radio. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a very good girl, I am. 
<laughs> but we, we were really intrigued to hear about uh, Joni's naughty girl days and maybe uh, if uh, I get her to have a drink later, she'll, she'll reveal a little, little bit more. Broadcasting your inclusion journey online, 18th to the 26th of November. You're listening to Reba Radio. You are listening to Reba Radio, broadcasting live from the bookshop at 66 Portland Place, the HQ of the Royal Institute of British Architects with Reba Radio. Woo! We've been bringing you 28 hours of material to help you build inclusion into everything you do. And it's all rooted in that foundational behavioral principle of CQ cultural intelligence. Cultural intelligence, the capability to work and relate effectively with people who are different from you. And in this final hour of Reba Radio, we're clearing the decks and simply reviewing what we've been talking about so far and talking about the actions that we can take to move us all forward. To do that, we have a stellar group of people uh, with the responsibility to guide and lead on these matters for the architecture sector. We have Alan Valance, the CEO of the RIBA, Jack Pringle, the chair of the board of the RIBA, Rebecca Roberts-Hughes, director of policy and communications at the ARB, Sarah Akinbogan, architect and founding studio director of Studio Aki and vice chair of women in architecture and founder of XXA AOC project and council member for the RIBA and me, Marsha Ramroop, I'm be holding myself accountable to as director of inclusion at the RIBA. So let's get straight into it. Um, and we've been covering these four capabilities of CQ across the, the last uh, seven days. I'm sure you guys have been tuned to the radio absolutely 100%. Um, and uh, on that first day, we looked at an overview. What is cultural intelligence? Looking at unconscious bias. We also looked at the inclusion charter of the RIBA. And we talked about the context of inclusion in architecture. On the second day, we looked at CQ Drive. You know, how do people get motivated to work and relate with those who are different from them? We talked about some really sticky subjects like white shame, and we talked about um, discomfort and fear and working through all of that. We also talked about the data piece and how that can motivate people to move forward. So we'll, we'll uh, dig into that a little bit as well. Um, uh, but also we talked about some of those lived experiences in CQ knowledge. So the lived experiences of women, uh, those of underrepresented racialized groups, LGBTQ plus lives, disability, socioeconomic diversity, and then some of those strategies around inclusive recruitment, inclusive design as well. So I'm going to play you a few clips of some of the things that, that have been talked about and we'll, we'll talk about them. So if we can start by uh, listening to David Livermore. Now, David Livermore is the president of the CQ Centre and he um, ha had a very particular view on what motivated people to actually be more inclusive and to take inclusive action. In some ways, I would say in a work setting, it might be best if it starts by talking about a very work performance oriented outcome. So I might be more motivated to understand your background if you help me see how knowing that is gonna help me get a better outcome over here. You know, what does it have to do with architecture? You know, like, like I, I'm a good person and I don't wanna be racist and I wanna understand that, but why am I talking about this at work? So I would say what it looks like in part is getting people very focused on an objective that that team cares about. And then along the way, hopefully we start to also discover like, whoa, you have some great insights that I would love for my kids to learn about or that I could really incorporate into the way that I engage in my community or my faith expression or whatever else it might be. So, so for me, I would say you start with what we measure as the extrinsic interest, what's in it for me to actually do this related to a work-oriented outcome. Because I think too many of our EDI efforts have for too long just used EDI is an end in and of itself and wondered why people are like, we're just doing this to be politically correct and instead of saying, well, there are good reasons just to do it, but it will also have good outcomes for us as a team. 
So coming first to uh, Rebecca Roberts Hughes, Director of Policy and Communications at the ARB, um, David Livermore there suggesting that the motivation may be the bottom line and that's what's going to get people involved in EDI efforts, equity, diversity and inclusion efforts in architecture. How much do you agree that that's the motivation for people in architecture? Yeah, that was that was really interesting to hear. Thanks for playing it, Marsha. Um, so ARB obviously sets the standards that architects need in order to become architects. We recognise the qualifications that people have to have for them to be able to join the register and design buildings. So it's really important to think about this in a professional context. And part of what we're trying to do at the moment is think about our role the powers that the government has given us that are there in legislation and the standards that we set as part of the code of conduct and as part of the way that we recognise qualifications and how we can build ethical behaviour into those things so that it's part of the profession through and through. And so I'm really interested to hear David talk about the professional context and why people might be motivated because it's relevant to their careers and their professionalism, because that's something we're really interested in as well. Alan, if I, I can ask you to um, to respond to that as well. I mean, uh, there is that bottom line piece, but surely it's about people. It's, it's just a good thing to do, isn't it, to try to be inclusive? Yeah, very definitely. And it, hi, Marsha. Welcome. <laughs> I'm, I haven't seen you for a week. You've been so busy doing this radio show, but well done. Uh, the, I've listened to a bit of it. Um, not as much as I was like, but I've been um, pretty busy with the RIPA. Um, and I'll be listening on playback. I, I think... Um, I mean, it is that you know, I sort of relate to my own experience as a professional over the years and, you know, that sort of rise of ethical behaviour, the rise of sort of inclusivity, EDI, um, you know, where we've come over the last 10, 20, even 30 years or so has been pretty phenomenal, actually. But it's it's a sort of start of a very long journey. Um, and I think we've got a very long way to go still. Um, I think at the heart of it all, you know, it. it I've, I've had experience in coaching um, and tapping into people's motivations and passion is always something that will deliver a better result. So, you know, understanding people, understanding what drives them, understanding how you relate to other people, all those things are really, really critical. And that, you know, professions generally have been very focused on the professional qualification, the technical skills development. But actually, it's about people relating to people. And, you know, the RIBA is a society, you know, it's about societal relationships. So that whole sort of interconnection between people, the society within which you operate, whether it's the RIBA and, you know, what we do every day in our business environment or more generally outside of the organisation as people, I think is really important. Uh, and I, I mean, obviously, I would agree with that 100%. I just feel that the um, intrinsic motivators and, and people being driven by something in in them themselves is far more sustainable than a, a bottom line um, uh, outfit. And, and I see you, you, you nodding there, Sarah. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us on, on this. Tell, yeah, tell me your views on, on the bottom line approach being uh, the driver for the architect, uh, architecture sector. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you very much for having me. Um, uh, it's a privilege to be part of this discussion. Um, and uh, yeah, you, you caught me nodding there because I, I think I would like to think that um, motivation would be um, would come from something um, greater than the bottom line, greater than commercial value. Um, of course, we know that there is a business case for inclusion, but I think that there's also a huge social case. Um, I believe that we as architects are custodians, we're custodians of the built environment. Um, that is fundamental to what we do. And I'd like to think that that would be a motivating um, factor for architects. Um, if I can talk about my kind of personal motivations, I know that everyone, um, not everyone is necessarily motivated by social factors, but um, Marsha, I know you have, a, you, you love a quote. And so I have one for you. Um, it comes from James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. And it's a letter that he wrote to his nephew. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just read it. So he says, my, my dear namesake, these innocent and well-meaning people, your countrymen, 
have caused you to be born under conditions not very far removed from those described by Charles Dickens in the London of more than 100 years ago. Um, and another quote, if I may, which speaks to that. Planners should be advocates for the poor and underprivileged, advancing their interests in the same way a lawyer represents clients. Uh, that's a quote, quote from David Davidoff, who was um, a theorist in the America of the 1960s. Um, and uh, I would replace planners with architects. Um, and I think that in order to be effective custodians, uh, we need to speak with a myriad of voices. The profession obviously needs to be inclusive. And I would like to think that that, um, that, that social factors like that would be uh, very strong motivating uh, factors for people. Jack, um, the chair of the Jack Pringle, chair of the board of the RIBA. I mean, listening to Sarah there, and and, and you're being a practicing architect yourself. Um, it, what do you what do you make of what Sarah's got to say about you know those motivations to to move the the profession forward, being greater than just looking at the bottom line outcomes of having a more diverse and inclusive uh, profession. Well, well, I agree with that. Before I get to that, uh, nice to see you again, Marsha, from uh, last night at that terrific celebration for our new president's first 100 days. Uh, I, I hope your head is a little bit better than mine because I slightly I was slow hardly drinking at all. I knew I'd be on air today. <laughs> I should have. I should have taken that tip. No, I I agree with Sarah. I, I think there are three motivations uh, for you know, diversity underpinning and being part of our practices. Um, one is just plain fairness, you know, and I, and I think actually Brits have a deep seated sort of sense of fairness. You know, it's just not cricket, people might say. And so, you, you know, I think the fairness uh, agenda sh should be in every right minded person's uh, mind. Um, the, the second, um, and I'll come to performance last, the second is, we're architects, we design the future, and the future is for everybody, uh, regardless of their background, regardless of their gender or, or, or race. And so it's really important that the people that design the future for everybody uh, are populated by everybody. So I think it, it's, you know, in terms of the quality of our product and, and getting the future right, uh, we need to have your know, representation of everybody Inside our, uh, inside our design teams. But I would come to David uh, David's, uh, Livermore's uh, uh, performance point last. I've run practices uh, large and small. I, I'm actually a, a new startup. I've been a very small practice now, but I have run large practices. And I've always thought that our performance, our success has, has been vastly increased. Uh, when we had a, a diverse set of architects who are, who were, if you like, pitching to clients, because we want the architects that are pitching to clients to reflect the client body themselves, um, and, and that, that leads to success. And, and also, we just get better work out of it. And, you know, I know there are statistics saying about, I can't remember what the, the uplift in profit is if you have a, a diverse uh, uh, staff complement, but it's my experience that it's true. So I go for all three, plain fairness, designing the future so you need everybody on board, and actually it does help the bottom line. Yeah, a mixture of both those intrinsic and extrinsic uh, uh, motivators. So one of the main things really about all of this is we have to measure. We have to measure how we're moving. If We, we don't know what to tackle unless we can see it. And uh, we spoke to um, Emma Weber of Lever Learning, who's been tracking change around the way that we've been implementing CQ here at the RIBA. And, and here's what she had to say. So I think with an individual, there's the data part, as we said, where it can actually help motivate people and give them the insights. There's also the benefit that you're actually then sort of tracking your own changes with your own data as you as you go through and kind of making your stories and truth behind that data of what's actually happening for you. So there's a way that we can impair our own individual journeys with that data. I think it then becomes possibly more so or definitely equally as important for the organisation and with the organisation to actually be able to identify if the dial is changing on things that they are looking to change and also identify areas where it's not changing and therefore what else can they do to support or create that change? 
So if I can come to you, Alan, about, well, first of all, talking about how we've implemented CQ and, and that um, transfer of action into learning, um, coaching that we've been giving all staff as well. I mean, how effective, just be honest, give, give me live PDR feedback <laughs> <laughs> on, on how that's actually been working out as far as you're concerned. Well, it's, um, so we get, well, we've been going for quite a few months now, but we, we, we made a big commitment um, you know, we're supporting the CQ framework. You're leading on that. We, we ourselves as the executive team put ourselves through the process first. So we, we had, uh, you know, sort of an eight hour session over two days with you. We got into some really, really detailed and really fruitful conversations. We've had sort of coaching follow ups and then that's been cascading down, not just through, through the staff structure, but also in the, um, the elected member ranks, the non executive streams as well. So the whole organization, the entire organization has made a commitment to sort of follow this through. So the, the sort of size and shape of that has been quite, quite incredible. We, you know, we're, we're a relatively short time into that process now, and we're all still absorbing, you know, the experience and the learnings. I mean, it's a great, it's a toolkit. It's a framework for understanding how relationships between individuals work, you know, societal relationships. And the RIBA itself was founded, was it 1834, 187 years ago as a learned society, but learned about probably things architecture, not necessarily people related. So I think it, that start of that journey has been very good. I think we're, you know, we're all still on, on that journey. And as I say, we will be for some time. Um, the toolkit itself is, it's, it does, it's not a prescriptive do this in this situation. And that's what it, what it needs to be. So it's, a, it's something that provides people with comfort and reassurance when they don't quite know how to deal with these confronting situations. And we've had that over the last year or two, you know, the Black Lives Matter issues, how do we, the RIBA, how do I, as the chief executive deal with all of that has been quite confronting. So having a toolkit, a framework, a, a place in which you can have a safe conversation, I think has been really useful. And I know the team have sort of fed that back to me as well. I'm, I was gonna make a point on data, but um, I, I think that sort of data grab was really, really important because um, the, you know, the, the, the collection of data, uh, having that information provides another safe way of having that conversation. But I think also it's, you know, there's an old, old saying about, um, I've got a dam full of, of data when all I wanted was a swimming pool of insight. So it's about collecting the right sort of information to deliver the right insight as well. And that has proven to be really, really tough, both within our organisation, but also across the profession. You know, what sort of data should we be collecting? How do we do it in a safe way? How do we reassure people that it's safe to provide that data? Because that will provide us with insight for more evidence-based decisions. And I think there's a, we've got to do quite a, a lot more to get that flowing. Yeah, and, and uh, Re Rebecca, you know, you and I have spoken about this actually because I think is it about 69% um, uh, of uh, registered architects uh, on the ARB website that that who declare their demographic data. It needs to be more than that, not just for for, for you, but for, for us at the RIBA and for the sector mm -hmm. as well. I mean, what what are you hoping can change so that we can be better at collecting the right kind of data? Yep, um, really true, Marsha. The stats have gone up since we last spoke, so I think it's around 72% now. Um, so thanks for supporting us in that. We've been promoting the importance of filling out this, this information anonymously to architects, but we're going to be using that next year. So um, we've just brought in a new policy officer to lead on equality, diversity and inclusion in ARB. Um, and, and what Esther is going to be doing is partly looking internally about what we need to do as, as an organisation, which is why I'm so interested in CQ and what you've been doing here at REBA. But obviously with our staff, statutory role there's a lot we can do for the profession as well so we're going to do a report next year which looks at the register we know right now what those 72 percent of architects have told us um, at an overall level but we want to break the data down and look at what's happening every year because i believe a couple of years ago we achieved gender parity on on incoming architects joining the register for the first time but there's a lot more that we want to look at we want to look at intersectionality we want to look at what you and others have on um who's qualifying and who's dropping out of the, the educational process which we're reviewing at the moment so so yeah it's it's absolutely important and it gives us a, a sort of state of the nation of architects what the profession looks like 
and the points that Jack and Sarah have made about working in the built environment, building a future for everybody, being custodians of the built environment. We want a profession that reflects society and that can build for all of the different sorts of communities and understanding who architects are in the register and how they get onto it is really important to that. How do you decide though what data to collect? Because I mean, this is something I'm grappling with. Um, I, 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 I don't know if you spotted it, but um, all, everyone who was involved in um, Reba Radio was sent a, a, a link to fill out their, their demographic data. There was a, a list of about 18 questions and it included things like caring responsibilities and uh, what your parents were doing when you were age 14, as well as, you know, those um, traditional, if you like, uh, protected characteristics around disability, age, uh, ethnicity, etc. Um, but, you know, when, when you have a that the intersectional piece, but also, you know, uh, if you're collecting something different from us to uh, the actual um, professions collecting, how do we make sure that there's a joined up approach as well? Well, I'm looking forward to working with you on it um, and loads of other organisations as well. So, Marsha, you and I spoke at um, a, a research symposium for FAME, female architects of minority ethnic backgrounds, and I've been talking to them about what data they would be interested in. Some of it we already have, but we haven't analysed it and published it in the level of detail that people would find useful. Some of it we don't. And if we were to start collecting it, we'd have to publicly consult on, on how we go about doing that. So if we're to change what we ask schools to give us as part of our recognition of our prescription, process we're going to have to consult on that and change it so we want to co-create the data that we have we want to talk to people work with you work with other organizations to make sure we're collecting the right information Sarah, um, you know, as a council member of the RIBA, somewhat um, represented uh, re representing that but um, there is an issue of trust, isn't there, when it comes to gathering data uh, from especially underrepresented groups that are fear that it might be used in, in, in a way that is detrimental. Uh, how do you think that we can build that trust so that we can effectively collect data from across, um, across practice? Um. Th thanks, Marsha. That's uh, that's uh, an interesting question. Um, if if I can just um, circle back slightly b before answering that, just to um, just to kind of reinforce um, the importance of data. Um, one of the things that I've been looking at slightly outside the RIBA with with the XXOC is is the history of um, female architects of colour, and one of the huge issues there is actually the absence of data. Um, so if, if the, the absence of historical data, and um, I think that speaks to the future as, as well, because the, the lack of this data means that we don't have a kind of complete historical picture. We don't have the stories that we um, necessarily need to, um, to, to, to inspire people um, to become part of the profession, to, um, you, you know, we don't have the stories that we need um, for education. So it's, it's just to, to make the point that it, it's really important that we collect data because um, that becomes part of the kind of future narrative. Now, I know that's slightly outside what we're, we're talking about now. Um, in terms of trust, I think that this is a, um, th this is a, a difficult one because obviously, uh, for example, if you look at something like the, the recent race report, which I, which I won't go into in detail, but I think that that is an example of um, a kind of mismanagement and, and distortion of data. Um, I, I think that people have to um, be very clear about the motives behind collecting data and also to be reassured that the right data is being collected. Um, I think that also having, you know, people from the, from, from the backgrounds that we're talking about um, as part of that process is really important in, in terms of trust. Um, and I think that, um, you know, beyond the data, it's, it's about the, the stories that we, um, that we extract from that. I think that that's, that's actually, you know, more kind of almost more important than the raw data itself. Mm. Um, Jack, I mean, do you think there's the in, uh, enough understanding in the sector, in the in the profession, that this is an important thing to do and to gather and to identify those gaps? Uh, I think we're getting there. I'm not sure we're quite there right across the 
the profession. Uh, for my money, it's one of the, uh, the top three subjects that we have to tackle uh, diversity along with uh, competence and climate change. But <clears throat> I think we are getting there. I think data is really important because un unless you're collecting data, you don't know objectively uh, what's going on, whether you're making a difference, you know, where the problems are. I think data more broadly uh, in the architectural profession is going to be extremely important because the profession that masters data capture first is going to you know, be, be highly prized in the construction industry. And I would like that profession to be uh, the, the, the architectural profession. To that end, uh, we've gone out for, to recruit a new subject matter expert trustee to join the trustee board. And we want somebody who has real deep expertise uh, in data. And I think we've found the right person. And uh, I can't say who they are at the moment, but, but if we do take this person on board, they particularly have experience in building quite large, diverse teams, deliberately diverse teams in quite challenging circumstances. And I think uh, that person, uh, it would be very interesting for you, Marsha, to speak with that person because they understand you know, how to harvest the right data um, and probably some of the, the sensitive issues that are embedded in it. So uh, I think it's very important. I, th I don't think the profession's quite there yet, but I think we are getting there. Well, certainly um, when I'm thinking about, you know, and I've said publicly about the kind of priorities for next year, data is definitely, you know, so high up on, on that priority list because it's so important to identify where we are so that we can know where we're going to go. Uh, moving on now, is this, there's so much that we covered in, in the 28 hours of, of, um, of, of broadcasting. Uh, a really important subject, a sticky one, uh, decolonisation. Uh, we spoke to Angela Saini, who wrote the book uh, uh, Superior, The Return of Race Science. We also spoke to Dr. Neil uh, Shusor, who's, who's writing a book for Reba Books um, about the, the history of 66 Portland Place and, and uh, the issues of decolonisation. And he, he alongside um, uh, Professor Corinne Fowler, who did the work around national trust properties, uh, which was talking yesterday about, you know, how uh, decolonisation needs to happen within architecture. But let's have a little listen to what An Angela Saini had to say about what, uh, what decolonisation is and, and what it means. I've worked with a few museums over the last year or two on this topic and I've seen firsthand how difficult it is within institutions to confront this because they are they serve so many different masters not just the public who are demanding this there's also a section of the public that are demanding that we don't do anything there's also the staff who very often demand that we do do something so you have all these different voices who want a stake in this narrative what does it mean to be british you know what what does the history of britain mean and how are we going to tell that story that is a fundamental question a fundamental question jack i mean is it something that the architecture uh, profession is is ready for to have this discussion around different perspectives on history and architecture well i think we have to be ready for it like it or not uh, because it's it's clearly you know, a very raw subject, there are very raw emotions um, that are sparked by it. And we, we've seen that only too clearly over the last couple of years. Uh, I think it, it, it is coming into the architectural profession's lens. Um, I mean, I sort of reflect sometimes, you know, how interesting that it is still so raw, you know, uh, you know given that uh, Empire finished, you know, over 100 years ago, I suppose. Um, but nevertheless, it is. It is raw. It's a raw matter. And of course, we're, we're about to, uh, you know, in our home, uh, 66 Portland Place, embark on a renovation uh, to bring it up to 21st century standards, to make it accessible, etc. And one of the, the topics that we're going to have to confront there is decolonization, having a very good look at the building and, and to see, you know, what we need to do about it. And I, I think we need to take good advice. You mentioned Neil. And I think he's going to be, you know, very helpful to us in looking at 66. And frankly, I think I'm going to learn quite a lot about the subject because it's not something that I've had to deal with myself in the past. So I'm, I'm on a learning journey on this one. Sarah, in your experience, do you, 
have you experienced the, the sector, the, the profession being ready for this conversation? Um, so I, I should say, so um, I'm obviously a practitioner. I'm also involved in education. Um, I teach design studio once a week. Um, and uh, I, I have to say, I think this will be a challenge, a huge challenge for the profession. Um, but also for education, I think um, that this is where it starts. It starts in pedagogy. Um, you know, uh, architecture itself as, as a discipline is um, kind of firmly embedded in, uh, um, you know, in, in, in a white male narrative. It, it's been said multiple times over um, the, the last week or so. Actually, I don't mean a white male narrative, but what I mean is that it has its, it has its roots in... Um, in, in classicism uh, and then later, you know, modernism. So we still learn about Corbusier, um, maybe not so much about Vitruvius, but the, but the fact is that um, this is where the discipline, not the creation of buildings, not the creation of um, the spaces that we live in, but the discipline of architecture comes from. Um, and so I think that that's really difficult because the way architecture is taught is still very much um, Im embedded in, uh, that this thinking is still very much embedded within it um but but what i'm encouraged by particularly over the last year or so is um i think there is a, a growing willingness to have the conversation um and I, I think that you know this this thing of decolonizing i think it should be and can be seen as a as, as a huge positive any any profession anything that wants to um let's say remain relevant to future generations needs to evolve and for architecture particularly here in the UK um, you know a, a country that has this this legacy of of empire and colonization which means that um, we are a diverse country um, you know there there are lots of narratives to draw on that it, it should be seen as a uh, as an incredibly positive thing um, you know so we, we obviously value other cultures. We have the Benin bronzes in the British Museum, for example, but but um, the cultures that go along with these artifacts have not become part of architectural education. And and, and that needs to change the, the um, you know, the way we teach architecture, the way we talk about architecture needs to change. But I think that should be and can be seen as a positive. That's a good segue to talk to uh, Rebecca about uh, architecture education and um, how uh, you perceive the future of it, especially when we're, we're considering these sticky subjects like, uh, you know, decolonization and uh, what that means for the curriculum, what we're actually teaching um, our young people. Um, what, what's the ARB's view on, on how that should look in the future? Yeah, so we've um, launched a review into education. So in our role in recognising the qualifications that architects need, um, we're looking at how we do that and the regulatory structure for that. And we've asked some questions such as, is the parts one, two and three structure still appropriate? Or is it stopping certain people from getting onto the register? Thinking about everything we've just talked about um, and, and data as well, the register right now is 1% um, black and 29% female. So it doesn't reflect society right now and what we've heard from architects is that the amount of money they have to spend training and going through their educational system can be a barrier um, we've heard that people have to have contacts in order to be able to get their professional experience their their um yeah part, part of their training relies upon them knowing somebody and being able to get a job in the sector uh, whereas other professions that might be part of the course and the university might help do it so these are really important questions that we're asking and as part of this review we're going to take an outcomes-based approach to education so rather than looking at the inputs and what people need to be taught we want to look at what they need to be at the end the skills experience knowledge and behavior that architects need to have in order to be able to practice as architects. We've got an event on the 9th of, of December, I believe, in which we're going to go into a lot more detail on this. And Dr. Neil Chassor, I think I've just seen in my inbox, has agreed to speak at it. So we're um, obviously great minds thinking alike here, Marsha. Um, but we're going to be talking about uh, if we were to set an outcome around professionalism and ethical behaviour, what should form part of that? What should architects be taught? And I think some of the questions we've just been talking about are going to be really relevant. Um, what, what do universities 
universities, how, how do universities train architects? What sort of questions do they need to be able to ask? How do they need to be able to work with different people, communities? Um, this is all really relevant to what we're looking at at the moment. And when you're talking about those outcomes, I mean, one of the other things that we were talking about yesterday was about international architects and the way that they're perceived as well. Um, is that uh, something that the ARB is looking at, you know, validating and that, that process being different at all? Well, we do know, we have heard from people that the prescribed exam that we set, so international architects who'd like to join the UK register have to have a certain amount of um, training that, that's equivalent to parts one and two, um, and then they, they can sit an exam to join that, that we set. And we are looking at how that works and whether it's fair and whether it will... Um, we, again, we don't want to prohibit people with the right sorts of skills and experience coming onto the register. And if the way that we assess and examine things are doing that right now, we should change our processes. So that is something we're looking at. Um, Alan, as, as part of um, Simon Orford's 100 Days, you know, he talks about this house of architecture, about 66 Portland Place. Um, and the work that Neil's doing around decolonisation is really uh, about describing this building, which is mm. quite rooted in, in those ideas of empire and uh, some of the, the, the elements of the way the building's constructed is, is can be quite seen as quite problematic. I mean, how do you view that as, as chief executive of, of this building and, and custodian, if, if you like, of it? It's a very good question. So last year, we actually had Neil um, present um, to us. We, he gave us a presentation, so in advice, he gave us a sneak peek of the content of the book. So uh, it was really, really interesting. And, the, and I was reflecting on the grab that you played just before and um, the comment around the fact that normally the staff want to get very engaged in this conversation. And what struck me was how engaged the RIBA staff team were in wanting, you know, we, we had several hundred people on the, on that presentation. We had an all staff meeting after that. We have, we have an all staff catch up every two weeks online. Um, and people were really interested in having that conversation. So I, I was really sort of emboldened by that because people wanted to know about the past and you know know the story that Neil and others was, were talking about to be you know to be more completely understand the way things have happened and to, to reinterpret that in, in the appropriate way um, and I think that's great and then and staff are really engaged in the conversation about um, the building and its redevelopment but of course Portland Place is is one asset of the RIBA we've also got the RIBA's collections of you know over four million items of architectural models sketches drawings in a whole you know one of the world's largest and, and most amazing collections to dig into that and to start to retell the story as well so that conversation is not just about this building it's about much more within the RIBA in terms of its assets and then about the people within it as well so uh, it was a great, again, lots of this, we talked about great start on the journey, but the building itself is, is rich. It's, you know, but it's confronting. You've got the, the Dominion Tapestry in the Jarvis Theatre. You've got the carvings in, in the Florence Hall. You know, there's some very visible, uh, tangible issues confronting everybody. So Neil's sort of guiding us through that conversation was just brilliant last year. And we're looking forward to the book being published to have more of that conversation going forward and as Jack's uh, said to feed all of that intelligence and, and that insight into the way in which the building is is redeveloped over the next number of years. So certainly from your point of view the RABA is quite happy to open up quite happy to open up that conversation and to encourage architecture to have it. Oh definitely but I mean I, I'd sort of relate back to last year when when the Black Lives Matter issue you know, confronted everybody very openly, the George Floyd incident. We we went through a pretty agonizing time um, to understand how we should how we should approach that issue, you know, how we should make steps to sort of acknowledge the issues of the past. And the you know, the, there was there were a number of people who weren't sort of happy for us to do that and a lot of people who were and some of us, you know, I had to make a decision. And I thought the right thing for us to do was to step forwards, you know, to move towards um, that story rather than to sort of ignore it and to shy away from it. And but it wasn't it wasn't a sort of unanimous decision, if you like. It was something that people took a long time to get to grips with and to understand. And and we move forward. But it was really, really confronting. And, I, you know, I think that's a that's a good thing to recognize. It wasn't an easy decision to make. It wasn't an easy step to take. But I'm really glad that we we've started that that journey and they've made those steps. 
Uh, speaking of which, uh, um, one of the other people we spoke to was Marvin Rees, and he's the uh, city mayor of Bristol. And we spoke to him about um, inclusive design and what it means to have inclusive spaces, especially in a place like Bristol. And, and this is what he had to say. Too often the voice from the profession has been, these are the kind of buildings we like, don't build tall buildings. Well, uh, great. Well, what are you going to say then to the, the, the you know the family I meet that's got three kids in a one bed bed sit temporary accommodation? To have to be credible, the profession needs to join the whole conversation about the complexity of social challenges we face. When we find that common ground that we're all respecting the the sheer range of challenges we're trying to take on in in planning our city's futures, then we can have a really productive conversation. But I, I think so part of that can be taken on uh, by the profession becoming more diverse, having people in it who've come from backgrounds when they've lived in a refuge and know what housing insecurity is rather than just going to you know nice schools nice universities and then you know have an appreciation for fine buildings around the world and i'm not saying everyone's in there i'm being quite <laughs> i'm being quite uh blunt in my description but it can feel like that when you're on the receiving end of, of, of the lobby of you know guys in corduroy trousers and Corduroy Trezors, and, and we said uh, black polo necks, actually, uh, Jack. Um, Jack, uh, what at the moment, what are the chances of those with a background of living in a refuge of getting into this profession? No black polo necks here. Uh, we, we need to lower the barriers to entry. That, that's, that's the key point. Is, is that the um, right? Is that uh, really what we need to do? Lower the barriers of entry? Is that what we need to do? I think so. I think we need to make I think we need to make our education system and our profession more accessible. And I think it starts at secondary schools. Uh, uh, and we do have a you know well established program of going into secondary schools and the most disadvantaged ones that we can to tell people about the profession. Uh, that we that we then need to uh, construct a diverse set of um, ways of being educated in the profession and eventually qualified. You know, the, the, the current uh, uh, route qualification is, is absolutely fine if you can afford that route. But, you know, it's actually founded at a time when there were full grants uh, to support people. I got a full grant to go to university and I lived on it very happily. Thank you very much. Came out with zero debt. Well, of course, that isn't true anymore. And so we need to have alternative pathways through our education system. The RIBA is already promoting these. Uh, with apprenticeships, apps, etc. Back in 2015, uh, I, with uh, others, uh, wrote a chapter for Harry Harris's uh, book, Radical Pedagogies, uh, where I promoted an idea of uh, a, a, a simple vocational first degree followed by a four-year part-time uh, uh, learning to complete uh, your course. And Reading University took that up, I'm very pleased to, to, to say. And that gave a much lower cost route in, in, into our profession. So, yeah, that's what I mean by lowering the barriers uh, to entry, to make it more welcoming, more accessible, more doable uh, for all sorts of people, regardless of their background. Uh, and one thing that we don't have much of here, which they have in, in, in abundance in the States, is scholarships and bursaries. And, you know, I think the profession could look to, you know, putting its shoulder to, uh, to those sort of initiatives to, to help people uh, come through. You know, in the States, some of the universities are phenomenally expensive uh, to go to, but there are monstrous foundations uh, that support all sorts of people if they've got the ability to go there. So uh, we need to, have to do a whole stack of different things. Uh, to enable people from all sorts of the backgrounds, particularly disadvantaged, to come into our profession. Rebecca, I mean, I know that as um, in your role as Director of Policy and Communications at the ARB, we, we've already spoken a little bit about the education uh, process, but lowering barriers, is that how you would describe it? Oh, I'm a regulator, so lowering anything makes me nervous. Um, obviously, Jack didn't say lower standards. I, I can agree with um, diversifying the routes onto the register. I think that's really important. The survey that we're running at the moment so that people can help shape our approach to education asks what the barriers are. Um, and I'm trying not to look at the, the results of it because it, it's open until the 10th of January, but I can't help a sneak peek every so often. Um, it's, it's really interesting. Um, some people think that the parts one 
two, three structure has has too many barriers in it. It's part two that people might might have a bit of an issue with. It's that, as I've already mentioned, getting getting a placement and getting some training on the job um, and whether or not they're supported in doing that. So look, what we're really interested in is what are those barriers and what can we as the regulator do to remove them? And how can we increase the ways that people access the profession. If you're a good architect, if you've got the skills, knowledge, experience and behaviour that you need to practice as an architect, it shouldn't matter how you got there. You, if you can demonstrate that, you should be able to join the register and design brilliant buildings for everybody. I just want to hear then from Adana Walker, uh, who runs um, Built By Us. It's a scheme to help uh, bring different people into the profession there would be no point for us to kind of be working away in a kind of little bubble. We really need um, the sector to be very much part of this. So um, engaging with us um, through the services and support um, that we can provide, um, but also recognising the um, opportunity to be allies. So joining as um, mentors and supporters of the programmes, you know, this is the way that we're going to kind of supersize our impact and our um, effect. We've got a lot to do because we have kept this on the nice to do list for so long. Um, however, I am truly encouraged by the sheer number of practices, the fact that we are having this conversation, um, the fact that um, professional bodies, um, um, sector leaders and organisations from, you know, 10 people right up to thousands of people are going, we can do more you know, let's work out how we can do it. And I'm so, so pleased that Built By Us is there as one of the organisations that says yes, and this is how. So Built By Us uh, working to uh, create partnerships between practice and those in underrepresented. Uh, are there enough partnerships, Alan, uh, with organisations like hers? Well, I guess there's never enough in the sense that there's more to do on everything. But uh, we, I mean, the RIBA, we, we've had long association with, I mean, Donna's a former council member and um, we know her very well. We've run sort of joint events with her. We did Stonewall events a few years ago. Um, we've got relationships that go back a long way with the Steve, what was the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust, now Blueprint for All, with Doreen's new foundation as well. We've got a range of other sort of associations and partnerships and they're you know, they've all been really, really productive partnerships um, for us as well as for the other organisations. Um, but there's always something more you can do. I mean, it, it, it's a sort of leading question in a sense, because the answer is no, nobody's done enough because here we are talking about the issue and what needs to be done. So there's more we can do. I think there is a balance to be drawn, though, with, you know, the, the multiplicity of partnership relationships. I think it's about the right balance, you know, the maximum impact for the resources you've got available. So there is some some form of priority and choice you have to make because at the end of the day, you know, our resources are ultimately limited as, as everybody's, but your personal resources, what, you know, the motivation back to the first comments and questions, what you can personally add to that is, is unlimited in that sense. Um, uh, Sarah, I'd like to give you the last word, if I may, about your hopes for the future of the profession. The ARB obviously talking with the RIBA all the time to try to push us forward. Uh, what hopes do you have about, you know, inclusion and uh, the architecture profession? Um, that, that, that's very kind of you. Um, I, um, I, I'd like to reference someone that I've come across um, over the last couple of years in my research. Um, uh, she's an American woman, Dr. Sharon Sutton, who was the 12th um, black woman to qualify as an architect in, in America. And uh, she was able to do that. Uh, she was a very gifted, uh, I would say, um, but she was able to do that um, by virtue of a scholarship. So back in, 19, in the 1960s, 1968, um, there were a series of protests in the US, um, not dissimilar to what happened here um, a couple of years ago, or, um, following, um, well, it's not a couple of years, but following um, George Floyd's murder. And um, as a result of those protests, she was given a scholarship to Columbia University and, um, and has then gone on to, uh, she's now Dr. Sharon Sutton, first full pre professor of architecture in the United States. So she's gone on to have a blistering career because she was given that opportunity and um, is arguably still inspiring future generations because of that. Um, 
she herself would agree with um, some of the things that have been said here about creating multiple routes into the profession, um, that maybe not one form of training fits all. Um, but ultimately, um, you know, she was given that opportunity at, um, at a young age um, to become part of a profession which she um, which she loves and continues to have a great influence in. And so that is what I would like to see happen for this generation. That's what I'd like to see now. Um, we are in a position to do that. Um, resources may be limited, uh, but, uh, you know, it is partly about motivation. We do have to want to do it. And I, and I think that there is kind of, you know, there has been a, a wave um, over the last year or so and, and I hope that we can continue. Um, oh, I'm hearing myself echoing. Apologies, that's thrown me slightly. Um, but yes. I can um, yeah, I can, I can hear your points there, that that uh, what we need to do is create a profession and a future that is inspiring and can move people forward by using those motivations to really push people forward. Alan Vallant, CEO of the RIBA, Jack Pringle, Chair of the Board of the RIBA, Rebecca Roberts Hughes, Director of Policy and Communications at the ARB, and Sarah Akibogan, Council Member for the RIBA. Thank you all for joining me on Reba Radio to open up these conversations to delve in into some of those weeds uh, and for being open to sharing some of the things that we can do together to make that commitment to quite literally change the world. We have to end with a message of hope. The size of the task can seem huge. There's so much work to do, so many parts to pull together. But all of this work is based on each individual owning and taking personal responsibility for their role, your role, in bringing about an inclusive culture. And this is the reason to have hope that we can achieve tangible change. The power of one multiplied is power indeed. This message of the hope that comes in the form of personal responsibility, I sometimes get from Kamala Harris. He says, years from now, our children and our grandchildren will look up and lock eyes with us. They will ask us where we were when the stakes were so high. They will ask us, what was it like? I don't want us to just tell them how it felt. I want us to tell them what we did. Or Martin Luther King, who says, fly. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, you must keep moving forward. But right now, I'd like for us to consider the words of Amanda Gorman in her poem, The Hill We Climb, from President Biden's inauguration. And she concluded, We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover in every known nook of our nation in every corner called our country our people diverse and dutiful will emerge battered but beautiful when day comes we step out of the shade aflame and unafraid the new dawn blooms as we free it, for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. And so I leave you with this challenge. Be the light, be the work, take responsibility, create an inclusive culture. It starts with you. Be the change. You are the voice. Use it. It's in your hands. You can start now. You have 28 hours of material, understanding, guidance, signposting to help you on your way. Cultural Intelligence, CQ, the capability to work and relate effectively with those who are different from you is the improvable skill that you now have the tools for to start to build your drive, your knowledge, your strategy, your action. 
and me and the CQ'd Reba team will be here to guide and support you as you build inclusion into everything that you do. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for engaging. And thank you for listening to Reba Radio. You've been listening to Reba Radio. Real, inclusive, brilliant action. Reba Radio was brought to you by the RIBA EDI team and the Architects Underground. Thanks to all contributors and guests, Jacobs Massey and studio producer Valley Fontaine. And we couldn't have done it without many RIBA staff members from across the organisation. Thanks to those teams too. Reba Radio, the podcast is coming. Meanwhile, check out Reba's YouTube channel and the Reba Radio playlist to hear all our content again.